Hi, I'm Vicky, the only daughter of a billionaire, also the sole heir from the third generation of an English aristocracy. Growing up, I was always referred to as Meepo Baby, but this is so unfair. If I had one sentence to sum up my entire life, it would be, well, that didn't go as planned. Before we start, please like and subscribe. I used to live the life of a princess. My house staff was on hand 24 hours to cater to all of my needs. And the biggest decision I had to make each day was to choose which car to go to school in. Still, I wasn't Regina George everyone wanted me to be. I was friendly to everyone and took both my education and my talent seriously. From an early age, I found a huge love for painting. You see, my daddy even invited global superstars over just so they could pose for me. Then, it struck me like a bolt of lightning when my daddy got involved in a messy lawsuit and ended up in jail. As a result, we had to kiss goodbye to everything. Yes, the mansion, the staff, but the worst blow was losing Brad, the butler's son who happened to be my boyfriend. My sweetie pie, I will collect the stars from the skies if it leads me back to you. Well, a girl gotta survive. So I did what I had to. I sold all of my beloved clothes and jewelry. But holy cow, all those Pradas, Gucci's, and Tiffany's still weren't enough to cover a week in a five-star hotel. Hey, use this. Miss, your card has been declined. Clearly you have insufficient funds and therefore must leave. Excuse me? The nerve, the ingratitude. I used to be one of their best customers. It wasn't as if I was the second inventing Anna or anything. So that's how I ended up here, under this bridge full of homeless people, desperately waiting for Brad to come back to me. In the meantime, at least I still had my paintings, which could be my ticket out of here, right? But Jesus, look! Those people kept taking them to smash cockroaches, while others even used them as firewood! Then, one day, as my belly was arguing with me over the lack of food, this charity group showed up. They came to distribute food to the homeless. I scrambled to my feet to ask for some, but was stopped by this woman. Look at your flashy outfit. You can't take food off the needy. How inappropriate. No, 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 I'm homeless too. Just then, a whiff of the Labo Santal 33 filled the air and a luxurious lady emerged from the crowd. She waved off the mean woman, then peered at my drawing. Did you paint these? Yes, I've been painting since I was a child. I've painted everyone from Taylor Swift to Ronaldo. Impressive indeed. I'm Diana, a widow of a great fortune. How would you like to come and live with me in exchange for sharing your artistic brilliance in my daily portrait? I was speechless for a few secs, then agreed right away. I was obviously destined to be rich, so it seems I couldn't escape my fate. I arrived at the villa, thinking that this was awesome and I finally landed back on my feet. But then, the euphoria was replaced with a gut-wrenching blow when Diana introduced me to her fiancé. Brad? Right after the awkward introduction, I pulled Brad away and confronted him. How could you cheat on me like this? I'll tell Diana. We broke up. Besides, having exes is normal. If you tell Diana I'm your ex, then it's you she'll throw out, not me. I couldn't believe the cheek of this guy. And you know what? We never broke up. I just couldn't spend another moment stuck with this jerk, so I decided to paint Diana a portrait as a thank you and then leave forever. Only, she really loved my painting. Thinking back to those glum days under the bridge, I realized, well, Brad was here, but so was a warm bed, steady meals, and someone who genuinely loved my art. This place was big enough to avoid him anyway, right? So far, so good. Well, until one day. All I did was ask the maid to get me a clean paintbrush when a guy got all grouchy with me. You have legs, do it yourself. Who are you to talk to me like that? Soon to be the owner of this mansion? Any problem? Leave her alone. It's what the staff are here for anyway. The room suddenly bristled with tension as Brad and that guy exchanged hostile looks. Then he coldly walked away. Suddenly, Brad pulled me out to a corner. Vicky, sorry for hiding it from you but I have no feelings for Diana. I'm here to spy on her as she's the reason your father's in jail. I'm here to find evidence and help him regain his honor. Wow, what? I know, it's hard to believe, but I need to cooperate with me. That dude is Charles, Diana's son. He'll try to mess with me by all means, so we need to stop him before he does. It made sense now. I knew Brad loved me really and wouldn't pick some old woman over me. Then he told me his plan. He'd continue seducing Diana and persuade her to get me to tutor Charles, while I had to befriend Charles to get information out of him. I felt kind of nervous, but the chance to clear Daddy's name left me with no doubts. 
However, Charles wasn't the approachable type. He was so curt and rude. And no matter how wide I flashed my friendly smile, I always heard no more than six words from him. Let's do some still life painting today, shall we? You do what you want. I was trying my best to teach him, but he doodled on the page and always came up with the worst drawings I've ever seen. Then one day, he suddenly insisted we go outside for some outdoor portraits, and he to draw me. So my plan did work! Yes! I excitedly stood in the bay window and did an elegant pose. It was sweltering standing there, but I endured it for the art. But it had been four hours and he didn't seem to have finished. I couldn't stand any longer, so I rushed to him and dropped my jaw to see what his canvas was. Totally blank! I am furious! <sighs> Calm down, Vicky. Perhaps Charles was like an onion with multiple layers waiting to be peeled away. So I decided to take a more psychological approach. I asked Diana for Charles' photo book and saw a family photo. This must be Charles' father. I'd paint it in the hope this thoughtful gesture would move him somehow. On Charles' birthday, I happily gave him the beautifully framed painting. Unexpectedly, upon seeing that, his face darkened and he had this fiery look in his eyes. He furiously threw the painting to the ground and yelled at me. Disappear! I can't stand you! What the? Fine then! Why is this guy gonna be so rude? I spent all week on that painting. What a psycho! I was packing my bags when Diana came into my room. She explained that the man in the photo wasn't Charles's father, but her ex-boyfriend. Charles's father died when he was little, then her ex was the one who had taken care of Charles since then. To Charles, he was the world. That kid was even closer to him than me, but then we broke up and he vanished without as much as a word. Charles has been hostile and distant ever since. I didn't know behind his rocky exterior was such a bitter truth, so I immediately found him. Charles, I'm sorry. Go! I might look terrible now, but I was once my father's princess. He gave me everything I could ever ask for, except his time. My parents divorced early, and I was left alone. Just like you, Charles. This loneliness, this yearning for a family bond, I share with you. Seeing his hand loosen, I continued. My intention was never to belittle you. All I wanted was to bridge the chasm of misunderstanding between us. Charles still stayed silent, but his facial muscles had relaxed. And when his gaze met mine, he slammed the door shut. So I decided to stay. And even though Charles continued being a grouch towards me, he stopped with the pranks. I also noticed that when Charles focused on something, he turned into a different person. He always stuck his tongue out, which looked adorable. Watching Charles drawing as if he was fighting with the paper, I came here and guided him, but suddenly our eyes met. He has such dreamy eyes. Oh no, Vicky, less of that. You were here to prove my daddy's innocence and get back to the old life. As for me and Brad, we had to make do with grabbing moments together when we could. When this is over, we can vow to be together forever and have a wedding more lavish than any of the Kardashians. My love, you must be patient. We will be together properly soon. However, when everyone was around, Brad kept up the lovey-dovey pretense with Diana. I knew it was totally fake, but I couldn't help but feel annoyed. I couldn't just sit there smiling like everything was peachy. So, after I finished the painting, I followed Brad, intending to ask him what the next step was after I successfully approached Charles, when I spotted him sneakily talking to someone. Hey Pop, yeah, Diana's like putty in my hand. Vicky complicated things, but I came up with a plan to deceive her. I thought that little pest would be long gone by now, but seems Charles hasn't kicked her out. Any ideas? The fury whirled like a tornado inside me. I instantly charged at him and smacked him in the face. What? You? Wait till Diana finds out about this. Oh yeah? If you challenge me, then be prepared to lose. Say hi to your bridge pals for me. I immediately found Diana and exposed all about Brad to her, but her face suddenly turned serious. I knew you'd say anything to divert from the truth, but I know you stole money from me. The maid found it in your room. Stole? What? What are you talking about? Then I looked at Brad and saw him smirking. That conniving mastermind. Before I could try and defend myself, a staff member hurried in and passed Diana a letter. Charles was missing. Everyone was freaking out and refused to hear me out. And the chaos left me powerless as my stuff was dumped outside the villa. I ended up right back where I started and had a complete meltdown. Worst of all, I was worried about Charles. Was he home yet? The next morning, I was trying to sketch something when out of nowhere, Charles appeared. 
He handed me the keys to this small but cozy apartment and told me it was all mine. Stunned and grateful also. I couldn't stand but hugged him hard. By the way, where did you go? Nowhere special. Felt suffocated, so I left. This time, Charles was like a different person towards me. He visited me every day and even helped me sell my paintings. Over time, my feelings for him grew and we started dating. Our relationship was filled with warmth and affection, and every moment spent together felt like a dream come true. Only, I felt so guilty keeping my dating history with Brad a secret from him, but the fear of losing him loomed over me. If he knew I'd approached him with hidden motives at the beginning, he'd despise me forever. But I had to at least tell him something. Be careful around Brad. I don't think he's a good guy. I know. He's a gold digger that's part of a romance scam ring, targeting rich women to blackmail them. Wow. Charles sure knew his stuff. Hang on. Does it mean that Brad intended on blackmailing me too, when I'd been rich? I'm going to expose him at the wedding ceremony. Come with me. Today is D-Day. The Grand Hall was drowned in the ethereal glow of lights. Standing in the center were Brad and Diana, ready to exchange lifelong vows. All eyes were fixed on them. Out of a sudden, the whole hall went dark, and an anonymous face appeared on the screen behind them. Tonight, we bring the spotlight on our group. Unbeknownst to many, our Brad Thomas is, in reality, Jackson Lord, born and raised in Pennsylvania by his father, Richie Lord the ringleader of scams to trick rich women into marriage and con them out of their fortune. Then the evidence of Brad being affectionate with innocent victims started appearing on the screen. After that, the spotlight immediately stopped on Brad, who was about to flee the scene. Diana roared in anger, rushing there right then and flung a glass of wine right at his face. The whole crowd started to murmur. Hang on, everyone. The party's not over yet. Check their menus to reveal the other accomplice. Everyone frantically checked, but then looked bewildered to see all the menus were empty. All except for mine, where there was a photo of me and Brad. So since the beginning, Charles already knew about my relationship with Brad? And he thinks I'm Brad's accomplice? I turned to Charles, but he immediately let go of my hand. We're over. This whole time, Charles played me like a hurtful trick, and even thought me capable of something truly awful. I messaged him to meet me by this lake where we used to go. It had been one hour, but he hadn't shown up. This might be the final nail in the coffin of our relationship. Just as I was about to let go, I saw him trudging towards me. Charles, listen to me. I'm not with Brad. I tried warning you about him. I heard the whole sneaky conversation of you two. Your love words and your filthy plan on my family. Then my private detective sent me those photos of you both together that proved me right. You hired someone to spy on me? Not you, Brad. That's why I left home. I thought you were my friend. And I thought we were more than friends. Brad and I did date in the past, but that's all. He tried to use me just like he used others. My feelings for you are real. You have to trust me. So? I didn't know about the scam. I'm sorry I ever fell for Brad's lies and first approached you. He told me your mom was involved with my father's downfall and I guess I still wanted my daddy to be innocent that I stupidly believed him. Charles didn't utter a word. He just turned around and left. But hang on! <laughs> May I ask, why didn't you publicize my face in that picture with Brad? I just wanted you to know what it felt like to be hurt. But I couldn't bear to see you hurt either. Let me go. I need some time. Then he left me there, watching him disappear in the dark as the world around me collapsed. After the rain, the sun finally shines again. The police finally caught up with Brad and his dad and locked them both up. Diana tracked me down and apologized to me. She asked me to go back to the villa and paint for her, but I refused. I can't keep on being so trusting and relying on others so much. It's time for me to believe in myself and stand on my own two feet. And more importantly, I couldn't face him anymore. Hi, it's Vicky again, but in a fancier version. After all the sweat and tears, I finally made it as an artist. I was just chosen to collaborate on an important art project with this big company, and my life would turn a new page upon opening this door. Charles! Hi! I'm Kaylee from Washington. I might dress like a boy, but I'm actually the girliest girl you could ever meet. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. 
I was born with shiny blonde hair and blue eyes, just like my mom. I never met my dad, but it wasn't really a big deal. There's no need to live in some fancy castle to feel like a princess. I was already one in my mom's eyes. She always pampered me with the cutest things in the world. You could give Rapunzel a run for her money, sweetheart. But tragically, mom left me in an accident when I was 10, and I had to move in with Selina, my mom's friend. She lived in a mansion where there were so many people dressed just like her. As soon as they saw me, they started to ooh and ah at me. What a porcelain doll. Bet she'll win any beauty pageants. She's just too lovely to be real. Shh, Miss Sanchez here doesn't like anyone who's prettier than her daughter. Yeah, she's been in a foul mood ever since the master left for his mistress. I only caught a bit of what they said before Selena dragged me into a corner. Sweetie, you heard them. Boys are bad news. Just look at your dad, for example. So stay away from them. Got it? Um... And the only way to repel them is if you look more like them. Then she told me to wear contact lenses to hide my blue eyes, cut my long locks, threw away my dress collection, and bought me clothes that basically drowned me. And voila, I look just like a teenage boy. One day, I was alone in the kitchen when I heard someone shouting, Bring me two smoothies now! I brought in two avocado shakes, but accidentally splashed one all over this girl's face, turning her into Shrek. Watch what you're doing! My daughter's angel face is destined to be Miss USA! How dare you! I, I'm sorry, ma'am. Relax, mom. Avocado face masks are all the rage anyway. Sadly, I still had to take my punishment, but suddenly the girl walked towards me. Hey, I'm Beatrix. Let's go and play. But I'm... Don't worry, I'm here. My mom won't punish you anymore. Then she took me to her room. Wow, she even has a castle inside? Beatrix then put some wigs and makeup on me. I looked at myself in the mirror, and memories of my mom came rushing back. I quickly pulled out the photo of her that I carried with me all the time. We looked so alike. I was about to take my lenses out when Selena stormed in and dragged me back to my room. Don't you ever let me catch you here again, and keep your distance from Little Mistress. We're not from the same world as people like that, remember that? But little did Selena know, Beatrix had just asked her mom to allow me to go to school with her. And ever since then, we've been literally inseparable. I mean literally. She clinged to me from living room to kitchen, from home to school. Honestly, the only time I could have a moment of peace was when I went to the restroom. Phew. Oh, maybe not. And each time we hung out was more than torture. I had to fight against the urge to act girly, hit my own hands whenever they started to reach for those pretty things, and now they ended up swollen. Think I'll glue them in my pockets next time. Then, one day, I arrived at school to the most terrible news ever. Kaylee, one of our female rugby players got injured, so I put you on the team. What on earth? I don't even know what rugby is. Here's Austin, your rugby coach. If you need anything, he's your guy. You know him? He might be handsome, but something about him screams bad news. People call him Awful Austin. You better watch out. And she wasn't exaggerating at all. On the very first day, he already pushed me to my absolute limits in training, but I almost passed out. In the agility ladder exercises, I got my feet tangled up in the line and fell to the ground. But instead of a hand, all I got was his soulless look. Then one time, I missed the ball, causing it to hit another player. Hey, is this a joke to you? Do it properly. Keeping all Celine's words in mind, I zipped my mouth up and ignored him. Who was? Definitely a boy. Oi, what's the attitude? You're bringing the whole team down. See? Cat got your tongue? Faking dumb doesn't work here. From tomorrow, extra training. No excuses. Beatrix was right. He was a devil. I was dragging my aching body home after training when I noticed a cute cat and stopped to pet it. The cat ran away, so I followed it and ended up at the back gate of the school, which was totally off limits. I've never been here before. Whoa, look at this beautiful mural. It's so mesmerizing. What you doing here? Awful Austin? Um, I just... Anyway, did you paint this? It's amazing. Of course not, stop crying. He was such a terrible liar. But to be honest, I didn't expect some jock like him to be interested in art, let alone actually be good at it. What are you two doing here? Don't move! Oh no, the guard has spotted us! Austin immediately grabbed my hands and started running. We hid in a small alley, and he pressed me against the wall with his strong arms. My heart was racing like crazy, and I could feel his too. 
We were so close that our faces were only inches apart, and the warmth of his breath made me blush even more, so I accidentally let out a squeal. Thankfully, before things could get any more awkward, the guard was gone. Don't even think of breathing a single word about this. Weirdly, this time his words didn't hurt at all. Maybe because I knew, beneath his tough jock exterior, he had his own secret, just like me. I like your painting, so no need to hide it. Austin stopped for a bit, then kept walking, but I'm sure I caught a smile. After that day, he started to behave quite differently, more gently. He no longer went berserk at me, but helped me get through the training instead so I could catch up with the other players. I just had my first successful kick. Yay! I turned around to cheer with Austin, but out of nowhere, the ball came hurtling right at me, and he instantly caught it with one hand, while the other held me by the waist. Okay, that was awkward. This week, there'd be a senior prom at school, and Beatrix insisted we go. Of course, I gave her a no, but she was literally a leech, so I had no other choice. Wear this, Kay. It's a matching set. It'll be so lame if I wear this alone, please. Fine, but only because you've given me no choice. Yay, love ya. Eek! Wow, it smelled so good. What if I put it on? But wait, what about Selena? Forget it. It's not like she'll be at the prom. YOLO. I stepped into the ballroom with this gorgeous outfit on, my blue eyes, and the necklace my mom gave me. Everyone jaw dropped as soon as they saw me, and that's when I noticed Austin coming towards me. Hey, you look different tonight. Uh, I mean in a good way. Wanna dance? Sorry, girls time. Kaylee, look at the tasty food corner. Told you we had to come here. Oh, Beatrix, my friend here is starving. Can you show him where to grab a bite? Wow, sure handsome. We have cupcakes, biscuits, uh, and even brownies. Isn't this called choosing boys over friends? <laughs> good for her anyway. <laughs> Then Austin gently led me in the waltz. He looked exactly like a prince from a fairy tale. As we fell in step, letting the rhythm control our movements, I felt my whole body tingle. The sparks were definitely flying, but suddenly the music changed into trance. We looked into each other's eyes for a second, then hand in hand ran across the crowd until we got outside. I could never imagine a tomboy could become like this. Actually, I'm not a tomboy. What do you mean? That's when I decided to tell him everything about how I was obsessed with girly things, but had to suppress it all my life. It felt so good to let it all out after burying it the whole time. And Austin was such a good listener. Wow, Kaylee, I'm so sorry. Actually, I've also had to hide my passion for arts to help my father's business too. So what you said to me the other day really opened up something in me. So things were not easy for him either, huh? Suddenly, he pulled out a sketchbook and started drawing me. I wish this moment would last forever. His face then went all serious, but not in a cold way as usual, but instead beaming with passion. Our eyes met, and I thought my heart was going to jump out of my chest. And yes, I hoped this moment would last forever too. Then suddenly, he leaned closer to fix my hair. I was ready for a kiss. Then, Kaylee! Selena, how did she find out about this? Man, you know what's coming next. I can't believe you'd be this reckless! You're not my mom! And not every boy is like my dad, you were wrong! Mind your manners! Get changed! Now! Right then, Mrs. Sanchez came to interrupt us. Hang on, are her eyes blue? And what's this? Uh, um, don't mind her. I bought this half price at the swap meet, ma'am. Then she signaled for me to flee the scene. If mom were here, she'd understand the way I feel. Blinking back tears, I suddenly felt a warm hand on my shoulder. Are you alright? I saw you leave with Austin. Did he cut your hair? It looks shorter. I'm okay, Beatrix. Oh wow, I have a similar necklace that my dad gave to me. This was from my dad too, except that I don't actually know who he is. Maybe your dad is my dad? <laughs> Zero for the joke, Beatrix. Oh, but why did Selena lie about the necklace to Miss Sanchez? So I went to find Selena right after, and she told me the most shocking thing ever. Beatrix's dad, the former master here, was actually my dad. He seduced mom, who used to be a maid here too. When Mrs. Sanchez found out, both of them were kicked out of the house. Then knowing mom was having me, he dumped her right away. Selena was afraid Mrs. Sanchez could see mom in me, and so she had to force me to disguise myself. Wow, this was seriously messed up. Keep your identity a secret by all means or we're doomed. 
Understand? I was in complete shock, but I knew I had to be more careful from then on. For the whole week after, Mrs. Sanchez seemed to be in a good mood. One day, she even asked me to go shopping with her. But a wedding dress studio? Is there a wedding coming, ma'am? Yes, and it's yours, you filth! You have to pay for your mom's karma for stealing my husband! So she knew everything? I tried to bolt away, but immediately got caught. Then she took me to this luxurious house, and guess who I met? Kaylee, what are you doing here? Uh, Austin? W what? What do you want? I was still bewildered when a man pushed a boy in a wheelchair into the living room. Hi, Mr. Fisher, about our arrangement. This is the bride here. She and Ivan here will make the perfect couple. Hope you like this gift as my thanks for your favor. My blessings for the marriage and your family. Dad, what is she talking about? Ivan will get married to this girl. I've already settled everything so that Ivan can have a bright future without worrying about anything. Excuse me? I've had to put aside my art dream to enroll in business school, as you wished, and now you want to control my brother's life too? I object to this marriage, because I love her! Then he pulled me away, leaving Mr. Fisher frozen in shock. Kaylee, I'm so sorry you had to meet my dad in such an awful way. I promise to never let anyone treat you like this again. No worries, I have to thank you instead. Your words really woke up the courage in me. Austin offered to help me talk things out, but it's time for me to fight for my own good. I came back home to see Mrs. Sanchez flying into a rage. How dare you bring your face back into this house! You cruel woman! I will not marry someone else just to pay off your debt! Right at that moment, Selena walked in, and she literally turned into a bull. How dare you do that to my child! I had to stop her from lunging towards Mrs. Sanchez. So how about what you all have done to me? Do you know what I've been through all these years? Her mom stole my husband, and you just expect me to put it aside? Then, she collapsed and burst into tears. Suddenly, I felt bad for her. I'm sorry for everything that happened to you, but it doesn't mean you have to punish yourself with it, or grant yourself the right to dictate others like that. She owes you nothing, and you have no right to control others' lives. Right after that, Selena and I packed our stuff and left the house. Walking through that door, we felt more free than ever before. After all that drama, it took us some time to get our lives back on track. From all the money Selena had saved working as a maid, she was able to open her own bakery and take back control of our lives. And so do I. Finally, I'm back to my princess style. But after all those craziest things happened, something never changed. Oh my god, oh my god, we're half sisters! Yay! Ah, uh, my mom said she felt so guilty about what happened, but asked me to keep it a secret. Oops. And about that guy, you ask? He worked things out with his dad. And guess what? He's in art school now. Okay, now tilt your head to the right. Yeah, like that. Gosh, that dress makes you look like a fairy princess. Who dare to make a princess stay still like a statue for more than one hour? Huh? The charming artist? Shh, it's almost done. I beg your pardon. Hi, I'm Lola, and like any typical teenager, I was always asking my parents for some pocket money, but they always said no. It's not that they were poor or anything. They just thought I was too young and irresponsible to have my own money. Silly, right? So, I had to take matters into my own hands. I couldn't just go out and get a part-time job, because I was only 15, so I googled some other options. One girl had written that she made good money from flirting with older men, but who was I fooling? I could never do that. I have self-respect. It just wasn't fair. All my friends at school had enough to cover their lunch and snacks and stuff, and even had some money left over to go to the mall and buy all the latest clothes. But not me. I was stuck in old clothes that had gone out of fashion years ago, and it was so embarrassing. And this had to change. There had to be a way. And then I found it. I was going to join the Illuminati. Yep, you heard me right. A powerful organization which is supposed to be secretly controls the entire modern world, probably while wearing cloaks, you know, infiltrating the media, brainwashing everybody somehow. I don't really even know if they are real or not. But anyways, basically, it all started when I put a message on my Facebook, asking if anyone had any ideas about how I could make some money. Well, five minutes later, I got a message 
from my ex. We only dated for a few weeks because he broke up with me for a girl from another school and I swear it's because I dressed so badly and had no money. I hadn't spoken to him since then, so I was surprised to see him pop up in my inbox. He told me about how I could join the Illuminati to be able to get some benefits from them. He said it was really exclusive, but he was in, and that was how he got allowance to afford everything he wanted. Then he asked me if we could meet up, and he'd tell me more. I immediately said yes, even though he'd broken my heart when he dumped me. I mean, that's how badly I wanted money. I was willing to meet up with my ex for it. And you will not believe it. He arrived at my house in a Porsche. I asked him if it was his dad's, and he said no. It was his. He'd bought it himself. And that was just one of his membership benefits. Then he asked if I wanted to join, and if I was serious. And all I could look at was his fancy clothes and sports car. I used to date him, and I know his family was not wealthy. He definitely bought it himself. And now, he looked just rich enough to not worry about how much things cost, and I was like, yes, sign me up. But he said there were some things I need to do before I became an official member, and that he'd send me a list later that day. So he sent me the list, and the first thing he asked me to do was to burn cockroaches alive. I mean, where would I even find cockroaches? I am literally the cleanest person you will ever meet, and so are my family. So there wasn't a chance there was even one sneaky cockroach hiding anywhere in our house. It killed me a little, realizing that I'd need to become messy so that cockroaches would start coming into my room. I started by leaving dirty plates under my bed. After two days of rotting fish lying under my bed, I honestly thought I was going to puke. And things just kept getting worse. Two weeks later, I swear my room looked and smelled worse than a trash can. And that's when the cockroaches started coming. One day, I came home from school, and they were everywhere. I started collecting them, and before my parents got home from work, I turned the stove on the highest temperature and popped them in the fire. I didn't even dare to watch them burn. It devastated me to know I was hurting them. But what choice did I have? I had to get approved to join the Illuminati. I made a video and sent it to my ex, and he said he'd forward it to the head of the society. In the meantime, I went to even more desperate measures to get some money. I have really short hair, so I can often pass as a boy, even though I'm a girl. Some people even think I'm a lesbian, so I decided to play along with it. I started to hang out with a few girls from school who were all lesbians, and I couldn't believe they were actually interested in me. I felt kind of bad. I mean, I didn't actually like them. I just wanted their money. Soon, they were buying me lunch every day, so that meant I could start saving up the money my parents gave me for lunch. But honestly, I just felt empty. I realized those girls felt sorry for me and saw me as some kind of charity case. So, after a while, I moved on from them and started dating a guy called Sandy. He was pretty cute, and I never thought he'd be the kind of guy to like me. And at first, things were great. But one day, he asked me for money so he could buy data for his phone. I said okay, but I quickly regretted it because then he started asking me for other things, like a new t-shirt, a cap, and then at lunchtime, he would just expect me to buy his lunch. But I never did. I always told him I didn't have enough money, even though I did have a little bit saved up. But I'd worked hard for that and wasn't about to spend it on him. After a while, he started treating me badly. And so it came as no surprise when he broke up with me. I didn't even care. He'd become a bit of a burden anyway. By then, it had been like a month. So I messaged my ex to ask if I'd been accepted yet. He just wrote back, laugh out loud, not yet. You need to kill two rats. Then they'll properly consider you. I couldn't believe it. I cried so much killing cockroaches. So how would I be able to kill two rats? I replied to him and said, forget it. This was a dumb idea. I can't do it. I'm not joking when I say that literally five minutes later, my friend messaged me and told me to go on Instagram. There was my video of me killing the cockroaches, and underneath it said hashtag cockroach killer. He'd even taken screenshots of the video and made a collage of all my different facial expressions as I killed them. I couldn't believe it! What was he doing? Was this some kind of prank?
And then another video popped up in my inbox. It was from him. He was speaking in it and said that he was never actually in the Illuminati. He just wanted to have a bit of fun and didn't think I'd actually be so gullible to believe him. Then he said it wasn't even his Porsche. He just borrowed it from his friend's dad and that he only managed to buy fancy clothes because he made money from his poetry gigs that he did every weekend. And then he just started laughing saying that I was crazy and he was glad he'd broken up with me. And what kind of person would actually be dumb enough to think that they could just join the Illuminati by killing cockroaches? Oh my god, why had I believed him? I felt so sad hearing him say all those nasty things about me. Pretty soon, that video went viral, and everyone at school saw it. Eventually, Instagram took it down. But it'll haunt me forever. The boys at school still laugh at me and call me the cockroach killer. Especially Sandy. He is like my biggest enemy now, along with my ex. They were so mean to me. But weirdly enough, none of the girls laughed at me. In fact, the lesbian girls actually stuck by me and supported me. And it made me feel so bad for using them. They genuinely wanted to be my friend. You're probably wondering if I actually managed to make any extra money. Nope. I'd say I'm even poorer now because my guilt won't allow me to let my friends buy me lunch, even when they offer. And of course, my parents are still as stingy as ever. Things are even worse now, as after the whole cockroach thing, they thought I'd gone a bit crazy, and even installed a security system at home so they could keep an eye on me. So, not only do I have no money, I have no privacy either. And it's all because I stupidly believed the Illuminati could change my life for the better. Yeah, right. Guess I'll just need to wait until I'm a bit older and can get a proper job and not rely on others. I've never liked hospitals. Yeah, I get it. No one really does. Yet here I was sitting in the hospital waiting area, silently praying that she would be all right. Jeez, I was shaking like an old dog left out in the cold. I just couldn't think straight. Why was no one telling me if she would be okay? Suddenly, a stern-faced doctor appeared and told me, Sir, the operation was a success. Your sister will be just fine. You can go through and see her now. I didn't know whether to burst into tears because of relief or to run away because of fear. Finally, I still went to see her. She blinked open her eyes, then fixed them on me, and in a groggy voice said, Who are you? I get it. My appearance unnerves people. I've never been a looker, and this scar sure doesn't help. But people will always judge. Maybe if they stop to talk to me, then I can tell them that I'm a military veteran who got it due to an accident during training. Training I was doing so I could fight to save their butts. Anyway, that's a story for another day. Now, talking about the girl in the hospital, let me continue my story. Well, it began with my evening shift as a delivery driver. I was humming along to the radio when this girl came out of nowhere and ran straight into the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes, but it was too late. I heard a thud. She was lying there all limp. It was horrible. For a moment, I thought she was dead, and I was too scared to check on her. Suddenly, a thought of abandoning her popped up in my mind. But no, I couldn't be that heartless, so I ran to check her pulse. Phew, she was still alive. I called for an ambulance and told her help was on the way. In the hospital, the doctor said she needed emergency surgery, but they had to have a relative's consent first. The girl had no ID on her or anything. What was I meant to do? I couldn't just sit there and let her die. So I blurted out, I give my permission. I'm her brother. When the girl asked me who I was, well, I had no idea how to reply. The doctor concluded that she must have memory loss. So, who are you? The girl asked me again. I couldn't go changing my story now, so I replied, I'm Chelvin, your brother. Oh, hi, Chelvin. I'm sorry. I don't remember you. This girl seemed so sweet, I instantly warmed to her. It's been just me and my dog Buster for I don't know how many years. 
Girls usually take one look at me and run away as fast as their heeled shoes can take them. But this girl wasn't looking at me like they did. The doctors asked me what her name was, so I said Alice. That was my mother's name. Before I even knew what I was doing, I'd use my savings to pay for her hospital fees. Then I visited her every day. I thought she'd ask me about her family, friends, I don't know, everything. But nope. She just liked listening to me ramble on, mainly about Buster. When she was ready to leave the hospital, I took her back to my house. I made up the spare room and bought some new bed covers, laid some clothes out on the bed, and put some flowers in there to make it look nice. Alice seemed to like it. She smiled, told me I was sweet, then hugged me. I bet I was blushing like a beetroot. I left her there to get ready. Then I made a start on dinner. She came downstairs in this dress I'd bought at the mall for her, and oh my days, she looked like a picture. I made an excuse to go and get her a drink, so she wouldn't see how flustered I was. I thought she'd ask me stuff about her life, but she didn't. Not one question. So I decided to tell her anyway. I mean, I'd spent days making the backstory up, so I may as well share it with her. It's just you and me now, and it has been that way for a long time. Our parents passed away some years ago now. Our mom, she was called Alice too. Oh, it's a nice name, she muttered back. Do I look like her? Um, yes, you have her hair. I told her a few other things, such as how she'd just broken up with her boyfriend and was in between homes at the moment. I know it sounds crazy, but it's like she was soaking my words in and taking some comfort from them. The next day, things changed, and Alice started doing erratic things. I went downstairs bright and early to find that she'd emptied all of my kitchen cupboards and was scrubbing them clean. When I asked her what she was doing, she ignored me and carried on. It's like she was in her own bubble and couldn't hear me at all. I told myself this was probably just her way of adjusting to everything. But then her odd behavior continued. When a delivery guy knocked on the door, she leaped behind the couch. Afterward, I asked her what was up but she said she was just looking for her lost earring. Another time, I was waiting for my favorite TV show to start, and we were both chatting on the couch, but she suddenly grabbed the TV remote, turned it off, then walked out of the room with the remote. This was normal, right? She'd been through a lot. Maybe this was a stage of her recovery? Most of the time, she was such a sweet and lovely girl. She always packed food and snacks for me to take to work, and she made such a fuss of Buster. Okay, so she still did her cupboard cleaning ritual every single morning, but hey, we all have our quirks. Having another mouth to feed meant I had to work more hours, but I didn't mind it. For once, I felt like a purpose. She helped me find the reason to live again, instead of just existing. I often took her treats home, such as cookies or Hawaiian pizza, her favorites. If I was working night shifts, she always waited up for me. It made me feel so warm inside when I arrived home and saw her sitting there with Buster. I had no money left at the end of each month, but I had something more. I had happiness. I liked this girl. I more than liked her, but I couldn't tell her this, as she thought I was her brother. I knew I needed to tell her the truth, but I just didn't know how to go about doing so. One morning, after she'd finished her cupboard cleaning and we were enjoying breakfast, I told her about the job I had on, delivering a parcel to Sherry Hill Street. Her eyes widened. Then she told me she wanted to come too. This was surprising, as she's shown no interest in leaving the house before. I mean, she refused to even take Buster for a walk, but I agreed without questioning her. I told her to wait in the lorry while I delivered the parcel. Only when I got back, she wasn't there. I ran around the block searching for her. But then I saw a crowd and it seemed like there's a car accident. My face paled. I ran as fast as I could to see who the victim was and luckily it wasn't her. Phew. I kept looking around and finally I found her. She was sitting on the curb with her head in her hands. She was crying. I sat down next to her and hugged her. She might be too scared witnessing the terrible accident. Then when she was ready, I took her home. The next morning, I went downstairs expecting to see her cleaning the cupboards, but she wasn't there. I made her some toast and a coffee and took them up to her room. She opened the door, glared at me, then said, I remember everything. I know you're not my brother. Alice, I'm so sorry. I just, I just wanted to help you. She shouted at me. My name's not even Alice. 
Then she stormed past me. I rushed after her and heard the door bang shut. She'd gone. So that's it. I was back to my lonely, sad life. Each day after work, I came home to see no one waiting for me. No hot meals, no laugh, nothing but a boring, empty house. Three months went by, and one day I was delivering some boxes to this rich shop owner guy. The boxes were very heavy, and one of them fell out of my arms and hit the floor. The shop guy started yelling at me, You idiot! I'm not paying you to be neglectful! But then what do I expect? You can't even look after your own face! I didn't say anything. Instead, I peered down at my feet. Then I heard footsteps, so I looked up and there she was. It was Alice. Oh no, I didn't want her to see me being scorned at like this. Suddenly, she shouted at the man. Hey, just because you have money doesn't mean you can say anything to others. Apologize to him or I will not let up on you. The man sneered and told her to go away. I couldn't deal with this, so I walked away. But Alice rushed after me and called out to me. Please, Chelvin, let me tell you the truth. I stopped walking, and that's when she told me everything. It turns out she'd never lost her memory. She faked it because she wanted to escape her miserable life. Her husband was a cruel man who cheated on her, beat her, and controlled her. He was a famous TV presenter, which is why she turned off the TV that time, as she'd seen him on there. She hid when the doorbell rang, as she was terrified it'd be him, and she tidied the cupboard every morning out of habit, as if she didn't do it back home, he would beat her. What? This was crazy. I needed answers. So I asked her, so you faked regaining your memories? And that outburst, it was all a lie? Chelvin, I'm so sorry. I knew I couldn't drag you into my personal life anymore. I used to live in Sherry Hill Street. That's why I came with you. I found out my husband thought I was dead, so he married another woman. I made him sign the divorce papers and set me free. I also made him give me a payout, else I'd ruin his precious career. Then she handed me some money and told me it was to cover the expenses for when she was living with me, and that she'd also send me some money to cover her hospital fees. We hugged, and I cried like a baby. Gee, this was all too much for me. But then, to my surprise, she grinned, went to shake my hand, then said, Hey, I'm Julia. It's a pleasure to meet you. So, after that, thanks to her ex, Julia was able to buy a nice little house. Actually, I'm helping her renovate it. We've become pretty great friends. To be honest, just looking at her makes my stomach flip. I love her so much. I know I need to tell her. Life's far too short not to. If she says no, well, then at least I'll still have her friendship, right? I might not have model looks, but I'm a good person. Julia's taught me to realize that. I hope she says yes, but what will be, will be. Wish me luck. I've always been an overly possessive kind of girl, and I can't stand it if people touch stuff that belongs to me, especially if they do it without asking my permission first. And my boyfriend is no exception to that rule. Honestly, I was so worried that he'd cheat on me that I literally couldn't sleep at night. And then I did something that I'll regret for the rest of my life. I met Otis in the guitar club at school. He was tall, handsome, and smart, which made him very popular. But he's not a playboy. He'd only ever dated one girl called Sam before, who he broke up with last year. I often wondered if he still loved her. But I'd started to notice him always sitting next to me in the guitar club, and soon we were talking a lot. One day, he confessed that he had a major crush on me and asked me to be his girlfriend. I couldn't believe it! I was on cloud nine! But very quickly, I started to panic. I didn't want any other girl stealing him from me. I made our relationship very public and shared our photos on every social media platform. We were inseparable, and I always kept my eyes on him. Otis seemed fine with this. In fact, he thought it was kind of cute how much I doted on him. But none of that eased my obsession with the fact that he might cheat on me. It was all I thought about. So there was only one thing for it. I had to test him. I had to make sure he really loved me. I created a few fake social media accounts and used images of really hot girls to see if Otis would flirt with them. Then I tried to add him as a friend from these accounts and send him flirty messages. 
One time, I even sent super sexy photos to him from one of these fake accounts. Believe it or not, though, he ignored them. I felt so relieved. So he did love me. I could relax. Well, for the moment, anyway. But it didn't take long for the worry to set in again. I'm not proud to admit this, but I even hired a boyfriend test service. I chose the most beautiful girl, even though the service was crazy expensive. I had it all planned out. It was just Otis and I at my house one night. We ordered dinner, and then I told him I needed to go buy some soda at the store. After I left, the girl arrived disguised as the delivery guy. She brought the food into Otis, and I sat in the car outside watching them on my phone. The girl had attached a mini camera onto the box of food, and she placed it on the table so I could clearly see everything happening between them. She was so seductive in her tight, mini dress and kept flirting with Otis, but he just wasn't interested. I sat in the car amazed. I was so proud of him. I had been sure he'd not be able to resist her. After that, I decided that I'd played enough games, and now I could really trust him. But then, one day at school, Sam and her new boyfriend, Lewis, walked past our table. She looked at Otis and said, You two look happy, don't you? I'm glad you finally found someone to replace me. Then she just walked away, without so much as even glancing in my direction. It was like I was invisible to her. So, she thought I was just some replacement, huh? That was it. I had to prove to her that Otis loved me now and that she meant nothing to him. Later that night, I texted her on social media, annoyed that she thought I was scared and jealous of her and that Otis only loved her? I couldn't believe it! I didn't know why Otis had dated someone like her before. I got annoyed and gave her a challenge that we would flirt with each other's boyfriends for a week and see whose boyfriend was a faithful person. She said it sounded fun and that she'd love a challenge like this. But really, I was only doing this to make sure Otis really loved me and had no more feelings for Sam. So the plan was set. That weekend, both Sam and I asked our boyfriends to go to the cinema, but then at the last minute, we both made up excuses about why we couldn't go, even though our boyfriends had already bought the tickets. I went to the cinema where Sam's boyfriend, Lewis was, and acted as if it was just by chance that I was there too. I asked why he was alone, and he said, Oh, Sam had a family thing, so I've been stood up. I told him I was on my way to buy a ticket, and he said I could just use Sam's. Yes, the plan was working. We watched the movie together and even hung out afterwards to chat. After that night, Lewis messaged me a few times, and one day, I even walked home from school with him. By the end of that week, it became clear to me that Lewis was actually interested in me, and he even invited me out for dinner. Otis was also still giving me lots of attention. He even told me about what Sam had been doing and was very apologetic. He kept saying it was really annoying, and why couldn't she just leave him alone? I was so happy to hear this. It felt like I'd won. Both guys liked me, and no one liked Sam. I decided to meet Louis for dinner and wait for him to tell me how he felt about me. Then I could tell Sam and she'd be so upset. Served her right, though, for assuming Otis was still in love with her. But that night, things didn't go exactly as planned. We were sitting having dinner when all of a sudden, Louis leaned into me and kissed me passionately. I closed my eyes and all I could think about was how I'd won. And Sam had lost. But then I heard a click-click sound and I froze. I opened my eyes, turned around, and there was Sam, standing there taking photos of us. She started laughing like a crazy person, and Lewis walked over to her and joined her. I had no idea what was going on, but then they told me. They'd deliberately done this. Sam had told Lewis to pretend to fall for me just so she could catch me out. I couldn't believe it. How could she be so evil? She sent all the photos to Otis, and now. I feel so ashamed. Otis was so angry, and no matter how much I tried to explain, he wouldn't believe me. And it's all my fault, all because of my possessiveness. What can I do to get Otis to understand I didn't mean it, and that I really love him?
I was standing outside of college chatting to my friends when suddenly a police car pulled up and from the car's window, a handsome police officer waved at me, then told me to hurry up. I excitedly waved back at him, said goodbye to my friends, and rushed to him in front of their admiring eyes. So I'm Daisy, and the handsome cop is Levi, my amazing, brave boyfriend. We first met at the library in town. I was there for my studies, and he was looking for some crime books. We started dating, and now a year later, we're madly in love. There are so many things that I love about dating a cop, such as seeing him in his uniform. It never fails to make me beam with pride. And I'm not gonna lie, he has abs of steel due to all of his workouts. Swoon! Besides, he has the cutest quirky habits. Like, when we go to a restaurant or the theater, he always scans it first to check if it's safe. But as good as being with him is, there are a few bum points, such as his unpredictable work schedule. Day, night, weekends, you name it, he works it. Then when we finally managed to plan something, he sometimes got an emergency phone call and had to bail on me. This sucked, especially when it was my sister's wedding. But without a doubt, the most annoying thing of all is his popularity with other girls. They're like moths to a flame around him, especially this one colleague of his, Ellie. One time, Levi brought his colleague Brad over while I was there studying. I heard Brad remark, Levi, I never thought you'd end up with a bookworm. I thought you'd end up with Ellie. Everyone can see you two have a strong connection. Levi tried laughing it off and saying that it was nonsense, but the jealousy rose up in me. By the time Brad left, I was really upset about it. So I packed up my books and went to leave. He stopped me and asked me what was wrong. Trying my best not to cry, I blurted out, Why aren't you with Ellie? You spend all your time with her. He shook his head, smirked, then said, Ignore Brad. He's a joker. And yeah, I spend time with Ellie. I work with her. But it's you I love and everyone knows it. In fact, why don't you move in? Then we can spend more time together. My sadness was soon overlapped by happiness, and I jumped into his arms and squealed out, Really? Yes, for sure! This was so exciting. I moved in a few weeks later, and at first, living with Levi was the best thing ever. But over time, there were little niggling things that started to play on my mind. For example, one day I was chatting to the new neighbor when Levi arrived home and in a stone-cold voice demanded I go inside. Then he sternly told me never to talk to strangers. But come on, I'm a naturally chatty, friendly girl who loves talking to people and making new friends. I don't know, I guess it was me overreacting? I mean, he was just looking out for me, right? But then his need for control worsened when once I arranged to meet my friends in town. Levi was going to come too, but then he had a last minute work call and couldn't. When I said I'd just get a taxi, he freaked out and told me I couldn't go. After I got upset about it, he reluctantly agreed to let me go. He called a reputable taxi firm to pick me up, then told me I had to be back by 10 p.m. But after a few drinks, I lost all sense of time. I was just having too much fun. I was dancing with my friend when Levi stormed in, grabbed my arm, and pulled me out of there. Everyone was staring at us, not helped because he was in his cop uniform. I even heard one man tut out, It's always the innocent looking ones, isn't it? It was so embarrassing. At home, I sat there brooding while he got me a glass of water. When he tried passing it to me, I jumped up to my feet and screamed at him. You're being ridiculous, and thanks to you, everyone in the bar thinks I'm some sort of criminal. I don't need a curfew. It's not like that, he sighed. But I was so upset, I brushed past him and slammed the bedroom door behind me. I cried myself to sleep. I hated arguing with him. I gave him silent treatment throughout the next day. But then in the evening, he arrived home with a gift box and apologized for making me sad. That was so sweet. I gave him a hug and said, I'm sorry too. Then I opened the box. It was a really lovely watch. I noticed that it had an extra button on it, but I didn't think much of it. 
I stared down at it admirably as he fixed it on my wrist. That's how caring my boyfriend was, so I decided to buy him something too. The next day after college, I went to the mall. Suddenly, Levi called me and asked me where I was. I wanted the gift to be a surprise, so I told him I was at home. Crossly, he said, Daisy, don't lie to me. I know you're at High Hill Shopping Mall. Come home at once. Huh? How did he know that? I gave up on finding a gift and went home. When he got back, I asked him how he knew where I was, and I saw him briefly glance at my watch. Then, he admitted that he had GPS fitted to it, but it was only so he could keep me safe. What? I wasn't a kid anymore. How could he use it to follow me? We had a huge fight, and I told him he was controlling and crazy, and he needed to stop treating me like a little kid. Then I shut myself away in the bedroom. The next day, when I woke up, Levi had already left for work. I was so wound up, so I decided to go for a jog to clear my head. Obviously, I left the watch at home, and also my phone. When I got back, I was about to head for the shower when I heard my phone ringing. It was Levi. Then I noticed that I had 50 missed calls and a ton of messages from him. What? This wasn't normal. I'd only been gone for an hour at the most. Anyways, I put the watch back on, then suddenly the door banged open and Levi stormed in, and he yelled at me, Are you okay? Where did you go? Why didn't you answer my calls? This sucked, as I love him, but I knew I couldn't live like this anymore. So I told him I needed my freedom, then headed for the door. He looked so mad as he grabbed my hand, pulled me into the upstairs room, then locked me inside. I banged on the door and pleaded with him to let me out. Daisy, trust me. This is for your own good. You're not safe out there. Then I heard his footsteps trail off and knew he'd left. I curled up into a ball and cried myself to sleep. When I woke up, it was getting pretty dark out there. I searched the room for something to help me and found a rope ladder. The perks of living with a prepared cop. I used it to climb out of the window. But as soon as I reached the ground, two men appeared. Then suddenly, the world turned black. When I opened my eyes, I realized that I was in a dark, damp room and I was tied up. The two men were sitting by the door and talking to each other. I began to panic. I'd seen enough movies to know that this was bad. One of the men looked over at me, and I quickly closed my eyes. But it was too late. He'd seen I was awake. So he walked over and said, Ah, welcome back, sweetheart. Panicked, I asked, Who are you? Why me? He sniggered out, Ah, yes. If only that boyfriend of yours was here. Then we could ask him. Then he picked up his phone, and seconds later, I heard Levi's voice in the other line. Hello? Remember me? We seem to have something of yours. I heard the fear in Levi's voice. Let her go! Your wife's death wasn't her fault! It's your fault she's dead. Now it's your turn to lose the woman you love. Come here alone, if you want to see her face again. And don't even think about calling for backup. He hung up the phone, then peered down at me, before he kicked the empty barrel next to me. I jolted back, and he laughed. It was terrifying. Not long after that, they dragged a beaten-up man into the room. Levi! Oh no! Levi managed to look at me, forced a smile, and slurred out, My flower girl, don't worry, I'm here now. The gang laughed at this. Then he stopped in front of Levi and said, I think you and me need a little chat. Let's call it man business. I knew I needed to find a way to help him. But what? That's when I looked down at my watch. It already had GPS, so perhaps the extra button did something. I struggled to press it, which wasn't easy with roped hands, trust me. But eventually, I managed to. By this point, Levi was unconscious and I started sobbing. I didn't want to lose him. Not like this. The one man set something up next to him. Oh no, it was a bomb! 
He sneered out. You have thirty minutes left to say goodbye to your lover, boy. Then the man left. I called Levi's name and sobbed out how I loved him. I honestly thought we were both going to die there. And watching the timer count down to our doom was the worst feeling ever. Suddenly, the door burst open. At first, I thought it was those men back again. But instead, Brad and his team rushed over, saw the bomb, then quickly got both me and Levi out of there. I was pushed to the ground just before there was a big bang, and the house exploded. On the way to the hospital, Ellie explained everything to me. So, turns out, this involved a difficult criminal case that happened last year. Levi had been investigating a group of drug dealers, but an incident happened, and the gang's leader's wife accidentally fell from the building and died. They arrested most of the dealers, but some got away, including the gang leader. Then recently, Levi had received images of me outside college and our house from them, and took this as a threat to my safety. Well, that explained all of Levi's controlling and weird behavior. I felt so bad for misjudging Levi. He was the sweetest, bravest man, and I loved him so much. I stayed by his side as he recovered in hospital. Then one day, he finally opened his eyes, looked at me, and muttered out, There's my flower girl. I hugged him. Gently, of course. It was such a relief to know he was going to be okay. The gang is still out there somewhere, but hopefully they'll catch them soon. I do worry about it, but it's okay, as I know I have Levi to protect me. After all, he's my real-life action hero, and I know that with him by my side, we'll get through anything. I opened the drawer and, aha, uh -huh, there it was. I'd been looking for this magazine for ages. But as I closed the drawer, I noticed something else. A photo hiding under the magazine. There was a woman and two kids in the photo. A boy and a girl. I was so confused. Hmm, who were they? I turned it over and there was a message on the back that said, This is my new number. Call me more often. I miss you so much. Suddenly my mom came in and I was about to ask her about the photo, but she got mad and started screaming at me to get out of the room. Never, ever come into our room again. Do you hear me, Erin? We have private stuff in here. You know the rules. I, I was just looking for the magazine, I said, and quickly tucked the photo inside before running out of her room. Actually... I knew I wasn't meant to go in my parents' room, but I was doing a school essay on sustainability and I'd seen an article in my mom's magazine about it a few days back. So I'd searched the whole house to try and find it. Eventually, I knew the only place it could be was their room. So I snuck in. Usually their door was locked, so I was in luck. Ever since I was a kid, I had been forbidden to go in there, but I had no idea why. Back in my room, I couldn't stop staring at the photo. Were these my relatives or something? Long-lost cousins? The boy in the pic looked totally like my dad. Oh no. Reading the note behind it again, suddenly I thought this could be another family of my dad. Do you know what I meant? Yes. What if my dad had a secret family? Maybe he'd cheated on my mom and had this whole other secret life. My inner detective was going crazy. There was nothing else for it. I had to get to the bottom of this and find out the truth. I searched online for the phone number and couldn't believe it when a girl the same age as me popped up. I started scrolling through all her photos and suddenly saw one of a young guy holding a baby and the caption said, Miss the old days of being daddy's little girl. This was insane! I was certain the young guy in the photo was my dad and I needed to talk to the girl ASAP. I messaged her and told her we were related. I even sent some photos of me taken with my dad to prove it. I was shaking when I saw her reply pop up. My dad never mentioned you. Not even once. That hurt me so much. I couldn't believe this girl was actually my dad's daughter too. 
Now, how am I supposed to break this news to mom? She'd freak out. I couldn't bear the thought of seeing this crush her. So, I decided to go clear things up myself first. A few days later, my dad was going on a business trip to Boston. Again. He was always going to Boston. I'd always believed he was just super busy at work. But now I knew the truth as my dad's secret daughter had confirmed she was also from Boston. I mean, of course she was. So, I told my mom I was going to spend the weekend at my friend's house. And the moment my dad left, I jumped in a cab that I'd called and asked the driver to follow him. When we got to Boston, I saw my dad stop outside of a house and then glance around as if he thought he was about to get caught. Then he got out of his car and rang the doorbell. A woman came to open and immediately they started kissing. Then a young girl appeared and, yep, it was exactly the people in the photo. I was shaking so much, I actually dropped the money for the cab. It felt like my dad had punched me in the chest. I was so upset. He had this whole other family that mom and I had no clue about. I couldn't stand it anymore. Mom didn't deserve this. I walked towards the house and was so focused on what I was planning to say to my dad, I didn't even notice a van pulling up right next to me. Suddenly, everything went black, and I realized I had been blindfolded. A huge hand was covering my mouth so I couldn't even scream. I felt tape being put across my lips, sealing them shut. Then someone yanked me backwards and shoved me into some kind of car. Oh my god, was I being kidnapped? Why? Had my dad seen me and now he was trying to cover his tracks? This was like something out of a movie. They even tied me up. After what felt like a billion hours, we finally stopped and I was dragged out of the car into a cold, dark building. Someone took my blindfold off, but it was so dark inside I couldn't really see anything except a single light bulb above my head. The tape across my mouth was pulled off and I was untied. I wanted to run out of there as fast as possible, but I was terrified. Two men dressed in black were standing in the room and one of them glared at me and said, They think they can hide you forever? <laughs> Who are you? I shouted. Where am I? If it's money you want, call my dad. Please just let me go, I said in what must have been the shakiest voice ever. Don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. We don't even need money. It's your parents we want. In three weeks, they'll be out of prison. And then they'll need to come here to get you back. Then we can really punish you for knowing too many secrets about us. I had no idea what they were talking about. Prison? My parents aren't in prison. You've got the wrong person. One of the men just laughed and said, It's been 12 years, and yet you still don't know about it. Then he walked off laughing his head off. What? What were they talking about? None of this made any sense. My dad was a businessman, and my mom was a housewife. This was all some big mix-up. It had to be. They'd locked me in that dark room. I tried to scream and bang on the door, but no one heard me. Or if they did, they didn't care. The next few days were some of the worst of my life. I didn't think I'd survive. Twice a day someone slipped food under the door, and I spent most of the time trying to think of ways to escape. There was no window, but there was a small air vent, and if I could just open it, I thought I might be able to crawl through and get the heck out of this disgusting, shabby place. Lucky for me, they'd given me a fork to eat with, and slowly I'd been using it to loosen the screws on the grid of the vent. Finally, on the third night, I waited until everything was dead quiet, and I got into the vent. I crawled through and managed to get out. I was at the back of some old abandoned warehouse, and as I stood up to stretch my legs, someone covered my mouth from behind. Oh, no! How had I got caught so quickly? But then I heard a voice. Shh, are you okay? I almost screamed. <gasps> it was my mom. How did you find me? I asked. But she just grabbed my hand and said, Let's get out of here. Then I'll explain. We climbed through a small gap in the fence, and then I saw a black car by the road. I started to panic again, but my mom told me it was for us. And then, as we climbed in, she said to the driver, I got her, James. Let's go. It was only then that I finally took a look at my mom and realized what she was wearing. She was in all black and looked like a spy or something. Um, mom, what's going on? My mom bit her lip and said she couldn't hide it from me anymore. 
What she told me next was unbelievable. Turns out my parents weren't even my real parents. My biological mom and dad used to be members of this mob, but 12 years ago they'd been given an impossible task and they refused to do it, so their boss said he'd harm me as their punishment. My parents had no choice but to turn themselves in and ask the police for protection for me. In return, they gave the police some confidential info about the mob. Whoa, I was shocked. So, you're not my mom? My real parents are in prison? I felt like my head was spinning. How could my life get so crazy? Yep, they're in prison. Back then, the police stormed into the mob's headquarters, but the boss had managed to escape. That's why we put you in the protection program, because we knew he'd come search for you. This was too much. I didn't want such a dramatic life. Then I suddenly remembered there was more drama. Mom, um, I found out Dad was cheating on you, so I followed him here to Boston. Did you follow him too? I mean, how did you find me? This was so weird. My mom didn't look sad at all. She said, actually, he wasn't cheating. That woman and those kids are his family. You see, at the time, he and I were the only two people qualified enough to adopt you. So he actually left his family to fake our family life to protect you. It was all part of the protection program. But he missed his family so much. That's why he went back to see them most weekends. I'm so sorry, Aaron. We didn't expect it to turn out like this. When you didn't come home on Sunday, I used the GPS we set on your phone. And that's how I found you. Okay. My head was spinning even more. Not only were they not my real parents, they weren't even a real couple. This was absolute insanity. And all to protect me? Wow. And as it turns out, it worked out pretty well. Because by tracking me, they found the new boss's hideout. And now the police had arrived and he was finally being arrested. As for me and my family, we had to pretend to be a real family. For now. And actually, it wasn't that hard because I loved them so much and they'd sacrifice the past 12 years of their life to protect me. I'd be eternally grateful to them, and my biological parents would be out of prison soon, and then I'd be reunited with them. I don't remember anything about them, but they also sacrificed their lives to protect me, so they must be pretty amazing, right? Ow. Jess, can we please take a break? Hmm. 15 minutes, okay? I'll go grab some Oreos. Our favorite. favorite! Ugh, I hate chemistry, and it doesn't like me either. The only thing I know is that cafe has two chemical elements in it, calcium and iron. <laughs> My parents are freaking out that I'll fail it. I don't know why. I mean, it's not like I want to be a scientist or anything. Anyway, they asked Jesse to tutor me. Currently, my grade's still lingering around the F mark. But there's no way I'm finding a new tutor. Why, you ask? Well, because Jess and I are the perfect match. We're both addicted to online shopping and love to read about the latest scandals to hit social media. And that quickly turned us into best friends. And this is my ABCDEFGH boyfriend, Bryce. Which means attractive, brilliant, cute, darling, elegant, funny, gorgeous, and hot. I lab him. So, you're probably wondering how I met such an awesome college boy? Well, it's all thanks to Jess, really. As turns out, she's one heck of a wing woman. So, one time during the break, Jess was looking up her college forums when I spotted Bryce in one post. Wow, that's a hottie! You know him, Jess? I pointed at the post. She then replied, He's so your type, right? That's Bryce. I heard he's still single. Go for it. I'll get your back. Oh, that sounds interesting. I grinned back. After that, Jessie went into full-on detective mode. After only 10 minutes, she'd found what block he lived on, what he's majoring in, and even the name of his pet dog. And since then, she instructed me on how to text, reply to, and flirt with him. Cool, calm, and collected. It worked a treat as by the end of the week, he'd asked me out on a date, and now he's my dreamy BF. He might look like the bad boy type, but underneath it all, he's sweet and shy, just like Edward Cullen. Aww. And guess what? We've been together for two months, and, um, we haven't kissed yet. But, so, how's it going with you and that hot college boy of yours? 
<sighs> I don't know. It's just recently, I feel like he's being cold with me. Just, I know he's read my messages, but he still takes ages to reply. And he never texts me goodnight anymore. Not like before. I'm trying. I mean, he seems happy with the pair of Jordan 4s and the new phone I bought him, but... <sighs> I'm not sure if he wants to be with me anymore. Of course he does, girl. You're a catch. He's probably just busy with his studies. I'm afraid he's cheating on me. You know, there's this Sally girl in Bryce's class. I often see that chick following him around, acting all friendly and making excuses to ask him to do stuff for her. Ugh, don't be silly. I bet they're just friends. This girl needed to watch out, as I wasn't going to let her just waltz in and steal my man. I slammed on the table. Seeing how frazzled I was, Jessie made a suggestion. We would take it in turns to follow Bryce wherever he went and find out exactly what he was up to. A few days later, I overheard Bryce on his phone talking about his study group at his house. Annoying Sally would be there too, of course. So, being the bright spark I am, I paid the pizza delivery guy to attach a micro microphone inside the pizza to spy on him. But, ugh, the only thing I heard was Bryce's hungry stomach. Yuck. Another time, Jesse texted me. Urgent. Saw Bryce in a jewelry shop buying an expensive necklace. Must be for Sally. Sorry. Fuming, I power walked the 20 blocks to his house. But his mom answered the door and proudly showed off the sparkly necklace Bryce had bought her for her birthday. Oops. Then, on one of my days to follow him, I decided to go in disguise. Um... The problem being, it was 28 degrees, so my choice of Sherlock Holmes outfit and fake beard wasn't the best idea. I'd just followed him into a grocery store when the world began to black out, and I tumbled straight into a display of cans. The last thing I saw was a group of people leaning over me, including a confused-looking Bryce. Babe, you're awake, but why the freaky costume? I sighed then replied, I'm sorry, it's just you've been so distant recently. Don't you like me anymore? He chuckled. Maddie, of course. I'm just busy with my graduation thesis. You know, I'm in my final year. Aha! So we were all good! Yay! So the next day, I bought us a set of those seriously cute couples rings from Tiffany & Co. to mark this. Peace was restored. At least for a short time. Lately, whenever we went out on a date, Bryce didn't pay attention to my words anymore and just had his eyes glued to his phone screen. Oof! He even chuckled and had this suspect twinkle in his eyes. So I tried leaning over him to see what was so funny, but I couldn't see a thing, as his screen brightness was lowered to the minimum. What are you doing? I snatched his phone, but... What? Wrong password. I bought him this and set the password as our anniversary. Why won't you let me look at your phone? What are you hiding? Nothing, Mads. I just like my privacy sometimes, that's all. Now, come on, baby boo. I'll get you a chocolate muffin. There's no way I was turning that down. Especially as thinking about it, it's the only thing he'd ever bought for me. But as I nibbled on my muffin and watched him transfixed on his phone... I couldn't shake away the feeling that something was wrong. I couldn't drag Jessie into this mission, as her studies were occupying her attention at the moment. It's okay. I can solo it. And this time, I won't faint. I swear. I did my research and found the perfect spy software. I know. I don't normally condone this sort of behavior, but Bryce was hiding something, and I needed to find out what it was. The software was simple to use. I just had to find a way to install it on Bryce's phone. The app itself could be hidden, leaving me free to read his messages without him ever finding out. Perfect. Mission one, how to install that software on Bryce's phone in a really short time? This is not an easy task. As Bryce is so obsessed with his phone, he even sleeps with it. On a few occasions, he does move away from it, but it's for a few minutes max, meaning, I needed to move fast. 
it took me a whole day of practicing to beat the three-minute mark. I tried it over and over on four different phones and at different times of the day to make sure it did work under any circumstance. By the end of it, I couldn't bend my fingers. Ouch! Mission one, done. Successfully trained even under time pressure. Mission number two, detect his passcode. I didn't know what his dumb passcode was, only that it certainly wasn't our anniversary. We went to the cafe and as usual, he was stuck on his phone. So I held up mine, pretended to be playing games, but actually turned on the camera and started recording so I could track the position of his fingers later when typing the passcode. It took hours, literally. Bryce eventually gave his phone a break to order some snacks. So after that, he had to unlock his phone again. Oof. Finally, after an hour-long video, I've gotten the footage I needed. Okay, Detective Maddie, ready, set, go. I rewatched the video and started analyzing it as soon as I got home. I stared at the screen with my eyes following Bryce's hand movements. He could be fast, but honey, your girl is already a step ahead. It didn't take long till I figured out the digits. Easy peasy. <laughs> Mission 3. Action. What better way than a lovely picnic to complete my quest? And as expected, Bryce just sat there, phone in hand, the whole time. Ugh. I wasn't even sure on how I could carry out this task anymore. But I told myself that the time would surely come. After a few hours, he was bored to death. And without even looking at me, he grumbled, Babe, let's just go home. I immediately shouted out, No! Not until I... Uh, I mean, it's so nice out here. I want to stay a little longer. You just... Take a nap. Fine. Wake me up when you're ready. I waited patiently for him to fall asleep. He was making these light snore sounds. Ugh, cute. I was so nervous. I bit down on my bottom lip as I gently pulled his phone out of his pocket. Then I turned my back to him and typed in the passcode with my shaky hands. And I was in! Yeah! I was so happy that I almost forgot and screamed. I did it all in record time. But he suddenly turned around. What you doing, Maddie? Can we go home now? He yawned. O-M-G. My heart stopped. Uh, oh, just a few more minutes. I'm editing the cute pics we took. Well, hurry up. Phew, that was a close one. I grabbed my phone to check if it worked, then... I turned on the silent mode ASAP, but it still woke him up the second time. As much as I wanted to snoop through his messages, I knew they'd have to wait, so we went home. Ugh, talk about girl message overload. There were dozens, all of them craftily saved under names such as Monitor and Professor. He'd even used my pickup line on some of them. Are you made of copper and tellarium? Because you're cute. Ew. Then I suddenly spotted a familiar face. Jesse? What? My bestie was secretly dating my BF? My heart sunk. This sucked. It didn't make any sense. If Jesse liked Bryce from the start, then why had she encouraged me to flirt with him? Jeez. The messages between them went way back. Then I saw one that broke my heart all over again. Maddie's family is loaded. Baby, let's pretend to be her BF, and she'll buy you whatever you want. Just don't take it further. So that explained his shyness. Why he hardly looked at me, and why after two months of dating he hadn't tried to kiss me. Then a recent message from Bryce to Jessie caught my eye. She's so boring. I got us enough money now, so gonna dump her next week. How dare they? Only, unbeknownst to Jesse, Bryce had dozens of girls on the go. Actually, he was meeting this girl called Tiffany at the movies tomorrow night. It was time to get revenge. So pretending to be Bryce, I texted all of the girls, including Jesse, to come to the cinema at 8 p.m. tomorrow. I borrowed my dad's baseball cap, wore my oversized sunglasses, and arrived there early, so I didn't miss the show. I even bought some popcorn and a Coke, as I wanted refreshments to watch this blockbuster. <laughs> ha! 
Then, at 8 p.m. sharp, Bryce strolled over, and boom! The girls arrived one by one, figured out what was going on, and started arguing with him and each other. Tiffany threw her popcorn over his head! Hilarious! And another girl called him a jerk and whacked him with her handbag, while the others were shouting and pulling his hair. And me? Well, I lurked, in the background, and secretly filmed it all. Oh, sweetheart, you're so dead! Wow, Jessie, our main character, has appeared. She took one look at the circus going on in front of her and instantly looked like a lion ready to pounce. She stormed up to Bryce, pinched his ears, and dragged him while in a high-pitched voice he said, Ouch! Ouch! Jess, it's you who taught me all of this! I'll call you later, babes! When these two almost passed me, I pulled off the cap and shades and jumped out at them. Voila! Could someone come and help me pick up their jaws from the floor? <laughs> Couldn't expect Maddie the mastermind, huh? I didn't stick around for their explanations. Instead, I shimmied off. But I did send her a little souvenir. Hmm, Jessie is my best friend, so I have to share anything interesting with her, right? Have a good night, my bestie, and my ABCDEFGH boyfriend, you too. But let me add the IJK. I'm just kidding. Yeah, as for me, I've decided to give my heart a break for a while, as this has taught me a priceless lesson. Don't be smitten with handsome boys. Oh, and be wary of sneaky so-called besties. So, the data needs to be collected by Friday so we can... I lowered my head and stuffed a pretzel into my mouth. Danny, are you eating? My boss glared back at me. I wiped my mouth onto the back of my hand and with cheeks full of food muffled out. No, no, of course not. It turns out my eagerness to eat a delicious, salty, crunchy pretzel during a work meeting, I had forgotten to turn my microphone off. Oops. Hey, so I'm Danny, and I'm in love with food. Why, you ask? Well, food's the one thing that's always been there for me. Through the good times and the bad, it's never let me down. All it takes is a hamburger with extra cheese and a salted caramel cheesecake, and I'm a happy girl. Gee, I'm salivating just thinking about it. But then my love of food almost cost me everything. Here's how. So after the pretzel incident, my boss fired me. Harsh. I know. This left me with no job. And as a result, no money to buy tasty snacks. What a bummer. One night, I was lounging on the couch, watching a movie and daydreaming about eating a triple chocolate sundae, when Jake, my boyfriend, sat down next to me with a huge bowl of candy and started telling me about his work colleague's birthday party. Ooh, candy. I grabbed a handful and started shoveling it into my mouth. Thanks, Jake. He knew the way to my heart. In between munching, I asked him, Can you bring a plus one? I want to go with you. Please? He shrugged and said, Sure. I clapped my sticky hands together. Ooh, a party! This was so exciting, as parties meant there'd be food and lots of it. As soon as we arrived there, I made a beeline for the buffet table. OMG! This was amazing. There were club sandwiches, mini pizzas, and potato salad bowls. I lifted the entire serving bowl up and started spooning the food into my mouth. Then some woman appeared next to me, frowning. She said, Um, excuse me, please, can you not eat out of the serving bowl? With my mouth full, I replied, Oh, sorry, it, it tastes so good. Then I placed the bowl back down and grabbed a handful of potato chips. As she walked away, I heard her mutter under her breath, What a greedy guts. Eventually, Jake grabbed my arm and led me out of there. He was sulking and could barely meet my eye. So I asked him what was up. What's up? He grunted. Do you even need to ask? You sit around all day eating everything out of the cupboards. Then when I bring you along to my colleague's party, you hog the buffet? It was so embarrassing. This bummed me out. Um, 
I guess maybe I could have a little more self-control around party food. And I guess I did need to find a job. Besides, having money meant I could buy better snacks, and I wouldn't have to keep on taking Jake's. So I got a part-time job at my local cinema, on the popcorn counter. Mmm, that sweet, buttery popcorn smell. How I adored it. I couldn't help it. It was there staring at me in all of its warm, golden stickiness. So in between serving a customer, I sneakily stuffed some into my mouth. What are you doing? My heart stopped as I heard a familiar voice behind me. I turned around and came face to face with my manager. I denied immediately. I I wasn't doing anything. As popcorn popping out of my mouth, they shouted at me and accused me of eating all the profits. So unfair. So you guessed it, I was fired. Again. I arrived home early with a tear-stained face and a bag full of my favorite chocolate treats to cheer me up. Jake looked over at me from the couch and asked me what was up. I slumped down next to him, pulled the wrapper off a chalk bar, and said, I got fired again. I couldn't help it. It, It's popcorn. It's too tasty. Does this world need to be so cruel? Then I took a bite out of the chocolate. Mmm, delicious. Jake shook his head, then sighing, said, Danny, admit it. It's your gluttony that gets you into trouble. So what? I enjoy eating, that's all. It doesn't hurt anyone. I finished the chalk bar and started unwrapping the next one. Jake shook his head, then walked off. Whatever. I didn't need his support, as I had delicious chocolate to comfort me. Yum. One day, like every other day, I searched the house for snacks but nope, there weren't any anymore. I didn't have any money, so I couldn't go to the shop. So instead, I went on my phone and searched mukbang videos to kill some time. As I watched two girls stuff their mouths full of french fries dipped in a strawberry shake, I had an idea. Of course. Why hadn't I thought of this earlier? I should become a mukbanger. I'd get to earn money while doing what I love, eating food. It was a win-win. For my first video, I kept it simple. It was just me in a white t-shirt, my phone as a camera, and a huge bowl of spaghetti. Crazily, people watched it and began following me. After a couple of videos, my popularity increased and my viewers started donating food and money to me. It was totally nuts. But with these things came the video requests, such as eat three tubs of fried chicken and ten plates of fried rice covered in mayo. Eating all this food did get kind of challenging. Once I was halfway through a hamburger eating video when I got a stitch in my stomach and had to stop. I so shouldn't have eaten pancakes for breakfast earlier. My fans were bummed out that I stopped the challenge and I felt really bad. I figured that if I was going to make this my job, then I'd have to start fasting beforehand so I could be at my best for the videos. Gee, this was hard work. One time I was so hungry, I went into the fridge and sniffed the cheese. But then when I finished a challenge, I felt so full and bloated that I resembled a puffer fish. Then there was the tiredness. I was so exhausted. I fell asleep on the bus to the supermarket and ended up in some weird town miles away. I had to ring Jake up to come and pick me up and he grumbled about it for the whole way back. Regardless of this, I carried on with the videos. But then one day a fan challenged me to the biggie, the fire noodle challenge. If you don't know what this is, then basically it involves a massive bowl full of the spiciest noodles ever. I took a mouthful of the noodles and OMG, I couldn't feel my tongue or face. My nose was running and I had to stick my tongue out to check if it was still there. This was just too much. There's no way I could endure any more of this. So I switched the bowl for non-spicy noodles and pretended I was eating the hot ones. Afterward, I edited the video, and hey, I think I did a great job of faking it. Even though I'd only had one mouthful of the spicy stuff, it was repeating on me. My stomach gurgled, and my tongue still felt numb. I lay on the couch with a hot water bottle pressed to my stomach, and feeling sorry for myself, Jake sat down next to me and gave me a concerned look. Danny, you gotta stop this video thing and get a real job. With my swollen tongue, I managed to sputter out, Eating on videos is a real job. Jake shook his head. Gluttony is not a hobby. Everyone's just laughing at you. Um, hello. I was being paid for eating. 
And these videos help many lonely people out there to have company during a meal. They were laughing with me, not at me. Jeez, Jake was so boring at times. Between the spicy noodle challenge and some weird bug eating challenge in which I used jelly worms covered in chocolate instead of the real deal, faking became the norm for me. Soon the articles started circulating saying I was a fake eater. Posts such as, she's faking all the time? And no wonder she's still in shape popped up everywhere. After that, I had no choice but to live stream eat. Lots of my fans encouraged this, but it was hard work. It didn't take long for the weight to pile on, and within a month, I was up two dress sizes, and I felt super sluggish. One morning when Jake saw me searching my wardrobe for something, anything to wear that would fit me, he suggested we go jogging. I stared down at my favorite jeans that I now couldn't get past my thighs and agreed to go. I had made it to the end of the block, and whoa, it was hot, and ugh, I couldn't breathe. I was crouched over, clutching a fence for support when a pregnant woman walked by. You're such an inspiration, running at your age and after giving birth, even without this one, she clutched her bump, I wouldn't be able to manage it. What? Did she think I just had a baby, and I was old? Oh, great. And now Jake burst out laughing too. I felt terrible. Did I really look that bad? This lingered in my mind, so I ended up going online and ordering some weight loss pills. I started taking them, and within a week, I had breakouts, stinky breath, awful wind, and I felt like a slug. Then one time I was in the kitchen taking the pills when Jake walked in, saw what I was doing, snatched them out of my hand, and said, Danny, look at you. You're a mess. You have to stop the pills and stop the videos. I was angrier than a nest of disturbed wasps, so I snatched the pills off him and kicked him out of the room. Then I yelled, You don't get it! Just leave me alone! Jake didn't say much to me after that, and I carried on with my mukbang bubble. Soon I hit 100,000 subscribers, and to celebrate, I went live with the table packed full of my favorite foods, fried chicken, pizza, donuts, and so on. I was stuffing my face when I felt so hot and sticky, the room began to spin. I slurred out, I I don't feel so good. Then I fainted in the middle of a live stream. I woke up a few hours later in the hospital with a drip in my arm and a serious faced doctor glaring down at me. They told me that I had high cholesterol and if I carried on like this, I'd end up with diabetes and stomach bleeding. Well, that was it. I burst into tears and vowed that I would make some big changes. I love eating. That will never change. But I just can't do the mukbang videos anymore. Now, I still enjoy food, but I don't overindulge anymore. Oh, I also have a new job working in a restaurant, and amazingly, I've managed to resist eating all of the tasty-looking food. I'm on the way to becoming the cute, confident version of myself again. And from now on, if I'm happy, sad or whatever, well, I talk to Jake about it instead of turning to food. I will always love food, but I guess I eventually figured out that I love my health and Jake even more. Shh, don't tell him that. It'll give him a big head. Hey, Dan? How about we go to that Japanese restaurant I want to try? Um, but my mom's expecting me home for dinner, Dan awkwardly replied. Again? I rose an eyebrow. Predictably, his next move was taking out his phone and calling Mommy Dearest. Mom says eating out is very expensive. It's your idea, so you're paying, okay? Excuse me? Did I mishear him? Unbelievable. So, through gritted teeth, I said, Forget it. I'm going home. Then I left him standing there with a stupid look on his face. Yep, that idiot was my boyfriend, Dan. He's in his 20s, but every conversation is still, My mom this and my mom that. It's so exhausting. At first, I thought I'd found a manly, impeccable man to rely on. Instead, <sighs> It just goes to show you, you can't judge a book by its cover, y'all. It all started with me coming back to the country 
and it was hard finding my feet here again. Also, I hadn't had a boyfriend for, let's say, a long time. I wasn't that desperate, but my auntie insisted on matchmaking me with this cute guy. I thought, why not? First impressions, Dan was fine. He'd just graduated from a prestigious college, and he seemed so gentle and kind. We spent a good time chit-chatting, so yeah, after that we started dating. It was swell at first, but then the abnormal details about him began to surface. We arranged a date at mine once. The plan was to cook a meal together, then relax watching a movie. But as soon as he arrived, he walked straight over to the couch and started watching TV without any helpful intention. I dragged him into the kitchen, passed him a carrot and the peeler. He looked confused, then stuttered, Er, but I don't know how. I tried to show him, but despite explaining it in great detail, Dan still fumbled to peel one lousy carrot. Then, yep, you guessed it, at one point he called his mom. Then he told me, My mom says the kitchen is a very dangerous place. I could cut or burn myself. We could go back to my place. My mom can do the cooking. I glared at his arms akimbo. Or or we can eat out, Dan mumbled. Only if it's on you, Claire. It's not my fault. I growled while shaking my head. Fine, then I'm not coming with you. Then I pushed him out and slammed the door shut behind him. What the hell just happened? Still, I told myself that maybe he was just scared, since he has never cooked before. One time we were in a clothes shop, and I spotted this shirt that I knew would suit him. It wasn't his usual style, but I insisted he tried it on, and ooh, he looked so good in it. Dan seemed to like it too, as he admired himself in the mirror, then said, It does look nice, but wait, can you please take a photo so I can send it to my mom? Well, she's the one who buys all my clothes, so... What? So now he needed approval from his mom before he bought anything? Jeez. Anyway, I took a couple of photos and he sent them to his mom. They exchanged messages, then he turned to me and said, Okay, mom says you can buy me it. Me? My eyes widened. Yeah, mom says you chose it, so you should buy it for me. Wait, what? I literally froze for seconds. Speechless, I could only glare at him before I found the means to leave. Claire, what's wrong? Dan chased after me, but I ignored him. Okay, I admit that after a few dates, it was easy to figure out he was a total mommy's boy. But I told myself that it was sweet he loved his mom so much, and I never expected it to be that extreme. After that, I used the silent treatment on him, but he wouldn't quit bugging me. Then, he told me he wanted to take me out to my favorite restaurant as a birthday treat. Ooh, this sounded great! Perhaps he'd realized something and wanted to make it up for me. We were holding hands and walking toward the restaurant when we passed by a shoe store, and in the window display were the perfect pair of boots. Well, I'm a girl, and it was my birthday. I pulled Dan's arm. Danny, look! I pointed at the boots. I want those. I grinned from ear to ear. Okay. Dan replied blandly. My smile faded. I mean, they'd make the best birthday present. Ugh, since when did a girl like me have to ask for a gift? Why? Dan shrugged. You like them, I don't. My face reddened with anger. But it's my birthday. Dan scratched his head and forced a smile. Sorry, babe. Last night I spent my allowance on some new games, so I'm broke now. I sneered, why don't you ask your mom? And he unexpectedly went mad. Hey, you're obviously the wealthier one. How come you keep asking me to buy you stuff? Enough! I stopped dead. I have never, ever dated anyone as awful as you before. You're a grown-ass man, so stop running to your mommy every time you forget how to turn the kettle on or stub your toe. And why on earth do you still get an allowance at your age? It's over. Then I turned to leave, without letting him have the last word. So freaking unreal. Trust me, to arrive back in the country and end up straight into this bizarre mommy's boy circumstance. But yeah, at least I was finally free of him now. It's been a few weeks since then, but just the thought of Dan still made me so mad. 
Ugh, I needed to get out of here and live a little. So I called my close friend Philip and arranged to meet him and some of my trusted guy friends at a bar. Cheer up, little girl, he teased. I know what will put a smile on your face. Our gaming group found this hilarious player. All we have to do is throw a few compliments his way, and he buys us all new items. Then, whenever we go out partying after a victory, this noob also pays for it all. What an ego. I mocked, congrats, bros. Wish my ex-date was also that generous. Then I rolled my eyes. He never spent a cent. Well, at least not without asking his mom for permission first. Philip laughed with a surprise. Hey, this noob's the same. He brags that despite being broke, his mom came up with the idea of matching him with rich girls so he can be covered. Hold up. That didn't sound right. I had a real bad feeling about this. Then Philip pointed across the bar and said, Oh, speak of the devil, and patted my back. A chill ran down my spine as I took a deep inhale of breath and turned to see it was Dan. And oh, he had a new girlfriend already. I quickly made up some excuse and bailed before they saw me. That night, I couldn't stop thinking about Dan's new girlfriend. Whatever Dan and his mom were doing was no less than scamming. So I arranged to meet up with Philip at a diner, and I confided in him about my history with Dan and how I was concerned about his new girlfriend. Philip offered to help and said he would try and find out more information. A few days later, he reported back with his findings. Turns out, Dan and his mom had learned the Claire lesson, so this time with his new girlfriend, Lizzie, they were playing it differently. Dan, as his mom had ordered, took some sensitive photos of Lizzie, and now every time she refused to pay for something, he threatened to post them online. OMG! This made me feel so sick! This poor girl was trapped and were sucked dry of all her money. This was extortion, and I was going to put a stop to it. It didn't take long for me to find Lizzie online. I then dropped her a message saying I wanted to help, and we arranged to meet up in person. After hearing me say that I knew the truth, Lizzie burst into tears. I can't let those pictures get out, so I have to keep on being his girlfriend and pay for everything. She rubbed the tears off her cheeks. I had to borrow money, and now the interest means I'm in thousands of dollars worth of debt, and I still have no guts to speak out. Let's put an end to this. I slammed my fist on the table. Be brave, Lizzie. I've got your back. The day after Philip and I went with Lizzie to tell her parents, it was bad. Her mom started blubbering and tried to cover her face while her dad went furious. No one does this to my little girl and gets away with it. Philip replied, Too right. The bad guys are going down. We spent the rest of the day gathering evidence, including all of the threatening messages Dan had sent her and the receipts she'd kept from the extortionate purchases he'd forced her to make for him. That was when Lizzie received a message from Dan. There's this expensive restaurant I want to go to. Babe, take me there tonight or else. Love you, X. Lizzie replied that she agreed. Then knowing Dan was out, we went around to his house. We confronted Dan's mom as soon as she let us inside. She was frightened and eventually confessed that she didn't have a job and it was Dan's dad who provided for them. As a result, she spoiled Dan so badly that it annoyed his dad, so he left. Then she sadly blurted out, He didn't say a word to me. He just left Dan a note that said, Take care of yourself and your mom. I knew Dan would be miserable without his luxuries, so I told him to find a rich girlfriend to spoil him and this time... She looked from me to Lizzie to make sure she would be too trapped to ever leave. There was a knock at the door. She looked at us awkwardly before she went to answer it. We followed her, and that was when we saw two cops arresting her. She bursted into tears as they took her away. I guess she thought she was a devoted mother who was doing right by her son, when, in truth, she went about it in totally the wrong way. She ended up going to jail, and her house was sold to pay off Lizzie's debts, As for mommy's boy Dan, as an accomplice, he ended up doing community restitution. Hey, this would probably do him some good, as he'd finally learn what a day's hard work actually felt like. Huh. Thankfully, Lizzie gradually got over this traumatizing event and was ready to start dating again. With Philip. Hmm. About me. Well, I'm still single, but I don't feel lonely anymore, as I have awesome friends. 
Besides, this way I have no guys bumming money off me. <laughs> I was swaying to the music with the hottest girl at school in my arms. Everything was perfect when suddenly I saw a flurry of red storming toward me and then the next thing I knew, I was being slapped across the face. Ugh, it was my ex, Rosie. She was looking at me as if she wanted to snap me in half. Okay, so Rosie and me had only broken up yesterday. But that didn't mean she had the right to go full psycho on me. Hey, so I'm Andrew and I like to think I'm a pretty smart guy. The problem is, I'm a sucker for hot girls. I tend to be blinded by their beauty. The result being, I don't always make the best decisions around them. But I had no idea what drama my weakness for a pretty girl was about to get me into. So it all began with the end-of-term college party. Me and my friends went heavy on the drinks. So when my friend Brad bet me a burger that I wouldn't go and ask Lisa to dance, well, I didn't hesitate in approaching her. Jeez, she's so hot and way out of my league. So I was expecting her to tell me to go away, but instead she smiled and let me lead her over to the dance floor. While we were dancing, she whispered in my ear that she'd always like me. Then, yup, you guessed it, Rosie, my crazy ex, stormed over and slapped me. I woke up the next morning with a pounding headache. Ugh, what was all that shouting coming from outside my open window? I wrapped my bed cover around me and shuffled my way over there to take a look. Huh, Lisa and Rosie were yelling at each other. He's mine, not yours. Stay away. He wants me, not you. Deal with it. Oh yeah? Well, maybe we should ask Andrew who he prefers. What's the point? As we both know, he'll pick me. I was far too hungover for this, so I closed the window and went back to bed. These girls, uh, they wouldn't stop. For the next few days, they bombarded me with messages and waited for me outside my house. Okay, so most guys dream of two hot girls fighting over them, but trust me, watching them pull each other's hair extensions out isn't as glamorous as it sounds. Thankfully, my prayers were answered by none other than Richie, my awesome brother. He showed up with a ticket for a luxury two-week cruise trip. He'd booked it ages ago, but then a work thing came up, so the ticket was all mine. Hell yeah! I hugged my brother, grabbed the ticket out of his hand, and started packing. The tricky part was sneaking past Rosie and Lisa who were still lingering about outside. So I borrowed my housemate's hoodie and baseball cap and pretended to be him to get past them. Result? They didn't even double look at me. Goodbye to my Lisa and Rosie nightmare and hello to the vacation of my dreams. Ah, this is the life. Trust my brother to book such a lavish place. My room was huge and it had my very own balcony. There was so much to do here, from the outdoor bar, dozens of restaurants, swimming pool, cinema... I was on my own floating complex. Heaven. The next morning when I woke up in my king-size bed, I took in the sounds of silence. Yep. Oh, sweet silence, how I've missed you. This was a no-girl arguing zone. <laughs> I got changed and walked over to the outdoor bar. It definitely wasn't too early for a cocktail. I had a pair of shades on, and that's when I spotted her. Whoa, she was beautiful. I quickly ordered two cocktails and began walking toward her. I was about to hand her the drink when I tripped over a sun lounger, and in slow motion I watched the cup fall. I desperately tried to grab it, but nope. Instead, I managed to knock into her back. She let out a yelp and then yelled out, You pervert! What do you think you're playing at? I stood there open-mouthed, contemplating if I should dive into the pool to escape this drama or not. Then I looked down at my sunglasses, which in all the action had fallen off. Suddenly, an idea came to me. So I bent down, stretched out my arms, and pretended to fumble around for them. She looked at me for a while, then picked my sunglasses up, placed them in my hand, then said, Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize. Here, let me help you. Then she took my arm and guided me across the pool area. I thanked her. And then, with my trusty shades on, I watched her walk away. So she thought I was blind. Yep, this wasn't my greatest idea, but it got me out of a sticky situation with a hot girl, at least. Later that night, I went to the buffet restaurant for dinner. I was stacking my plate when I bumped straight into someone and almost dropped my plate. Ugh, it was that odd girl again. I quickly put my shades on, then deliberately turned the wrong way and loudly said, Oh, I'm sorry. She put her hand on my shoulder and guided me so I was facing her, then said, yeah, It's me, the girl from the pool. And it's okay, I should have been looking where I was going. Um, do you need any help? I quickly cut her off. No thanks, it's okay. Then I lifted my plate up to my nose and sniffed it. Mmm, these prawns sure smell good. 
She raised an eyebrow at my food-smelling talent, so I carried on pretending to sniff the food as I put it on my plate. And you know what? She wouldn't quit staring at me. Eventually, she walked off. Phew, what a narrow escape. Afterward, I went to the top deck bar to chill out. With yet another cocktail. Then who should walk over, but yup, you guessed it, the hot girl. I immediately looked away from her, but what's this? She walked over to me and sat down opposite me. Hey, do you remember me? She asked. Seeing my chance to flirt with her, I replied. Oh yes, how could I forget someone as beautiful as you are? Huh? How do you know that I'm beautiful? Damn it, I needed to think before I spoke. Ah, well, it's your voice. A sweet voice like yours can only belong to a beautiful girl. Crisis averted. As after that, we started chatting and oh boy, oh boy, she's a sweetheart. Do you know that she's an activist for an organization that works hard to guarantee the rights of baby girls born in Africa? I know, amazing. The evening came to an end and she said, Oh, my name's Bella, by the way. I replied, Bella, a name as beautiful as your soul. Mine's Andrew. She gave me a nervous giggle. Well, Andrew, <laughs> it's getting late, so I suppose I better get back to my cabin. I didn't want the night to ever end, so I blurted out, Whoa, Bella, look at the sky. Isn't it so stunning? She glared at me and then replied, How would you know that? Oops, of course, I was meant to be blind. Um, uh, I can feel it from the breeze. She gave me a quizzing look, then said, Right, well, good night. How about we meet at the arcade tomorrow, let's say 10 a.m.? I excitedly agreed, then she left. Another close escape. I really needed to be more careful. Bella, Bella, Bella. I couldn't stop thinking of her. The next day, I'm such a kid when it comes to arcades, I can't help it. My inner child comes out and, ooh, a car racing game. Nope, I was pretending to be blind. So I awkwardly lingered in the foyer and waited for Bella to show up. When she did, she took my arm and guided me through the arcade. She described all the different games machines to me, which I thought was really sweet. Then she led me over to the plushie grabber machine and squealed excitedly. Hoo-hoo, I loved these as a kid. Soon I was fumbling about to slot my money in, adamant I was going to win her a plushie. But wait, uh, I was meant to be blind. So I touched the controls, then closed my eyes. Her laughter said it all. Massive fail. It was all going to be okay, until Bella had to use the restroom, and instructed me to stay put and wait for her by a shooting game machine. Which so happened to be my all-time favorite arcade game. I rushed over to it as soon as she was out of sight, grabbed a gun, and shot five cans in a row. Then I jumped up and down and whooped in the air. I turned around and saw Bella frowning at me. Oh boy, busted. I tried to explain, but she just shook her head and said, How could you? You're a coward, a pervert, and a liar. Then she ran off. I felt terrible. I tried searching the ship for her, but I couldn't find her anywhere. Feeling bummed out, I ordered a cocktail, then went for a walk across the deck. Suddenly, I heard shouting coming from below me. What was that? I peered down and saw a man and a woman trying to drag a little girl into one of the safety rafts. Hang on, they weren't alone. Bella was there too. She was trying to pull the little girl away from them. Without even thinking, I dropped my drink and ran over to them. I charged towards the woman and knocked her so hard she almost fell into the sea. The man reached out to steady her, which gave Bella a chance to pick up the kid. Then she grabbed my arm and pulled me away. After that, the bad guys jumped into the raft and sailed away. We returned the girl to her parents. It turns out Bella was on her way to her cabin when she saw a couple in tears as they couldn't find their daughter. So she went looking for her and walked in on the kidnapping. After that, Bella forgave me. Well, I did save the day and all. And we spent the rest of the trip together. Then on our last day, I got down on one knee and asked her to be my girlfriend. And she said yes. I took her back home with me. And as we walked over to my house, Lisa and Rosie ran towards me and started arguing with each other about who I liked more. Oh shoot, I'd forgotten about them. Reading the situation, Bella approached them. Thank God you're here. I assume one of you is his girlfriend, right? There was an accident, and Andrew's blind now, and he really needs someone by his side 24-7. Hearing that, I quickly coordinated with her by waving my arms wildly about. So, which one is your girlfriend, Andy? Uh, it's Lisa. Rosie quickly chimed in. No, uh, he's all yours. We only hung out once. Ha, <laughs> what suckers. I watched them run away. Then Bella and I burst out laughing. After that, I held my arm out to her and let her guide me home, you know, for old time's sake. Lying to her about being blind was a jerky thing to do, but I only did it in the first place because being around beautiful girls makes me so nervous I do dumb stuff. It's just lucky that Bella forgave me, because I think this dumbass may have found his dream girl.
Really? You're from Korea? No way. You sound just like a native speaker. Richard jumped up in surprise as I told him I came from South Korea. Yeah, I'm 100% Korean. I answered him giggling. <laughs> I had spent hours every day practicing my English. Guess it has paid off. But that was six years ago already. I'm Jenny, by the way, and I'm Korean. At the time I was 21, I joined an online English speaking club where I first met Richard, who never in a million years did I think I'd fall in love with. But that's exactly what happened. Ever since that very first class, we started talking every day, and the sparks between us were undeniable. He always mentioned how he wished I could be in the Czech Republic with him, and I found myself daydreaming about our future wedding. Okay, so I was getting ahead of myself, but he was just so amazing. After a month of talking nonstop, I realized I was probably going to fail college if I didn't start setting my priorities straight. But all I could think about was him. And whenever we weren't chatting, I was stalking him on social media. And every time I saw him tagged with another girl, I got so jealous. This couldn't be healthy. I mean, I hadn't even met him in real life. But still, we continued to fall for each other. And he even introduced me to his two best friends, Anastasia and Pavel, via video chat. But not as blossoming as my love life, I was failing miserably at college. I'd always been the one who laughed at my lovesick friends, and now I was no better than them. This wasn't right. Something had to change. So even though it was killing me inside to do this, one night before sitting down on my desk to work on my assignment, I just picked up my phone and blocked his WhatsApp, deactivated my Facebook, and all without letting him know. Yep, I full-on ghosted him. It was such a hard decision. Because that night, instead of getting anything done for the assignment, I found myself lying in bed with a tear-soaked pillow. It hurt so much but I had to think about my future. My parents would kill me if I didn't get a good job. I couldn't let them down. Anyway, Pavel messaged me a few days later saying Richard had gone totally crazy and he'd never seen him this upset before. He barely ate anything and would drink all day. He's not much different from a zombie now, but I stayed unfazed. Bet he'd be okay though. He was young and handsome and girls were always after him. He'd get over me soon and I'd get over him, right? If only it were that easy. I missed him every single day. Even though we'd been thousands of miles apart, he somehow always made me feel so safe, like he was right there next to me. What had I done? I'd ruined everything. Ugh. Instead of wasting time overthinking, it'd be better to put all my energy into my studies for now, right? And it worked. When graduation came around, I was the top student in my class and even got accepted on an exchange program in Australia. Without even thinking, I texted Richard to tell him the good news. I apologized for disappearing on him and said it had messed with my mind because I hadn't expected to fall for him so hard. I had just needed some time to finish my studies, but now I was ready to reconnect again. Well, he'd seen my messages, but there was no reply. It felt like someone had punched me in the heart. Hours later, he finally replied and said, Sorry, Jenny. I'll get in touch soon. Now isn't the best time. I couldn't believe the words I was reading. I could actually hear the sound of my heart shattering, but it served me right. I was the one who'd gotten rid of him. He deserved better. But still, I stalked him every day online, and then I realized the only way to solve this would be to fly to the Czech Republic and find him. First, though, I had my exchange program in Australia. I bought a new phone and got a new number for the trip to leave my old one in Korea for my uncle who was always complaining about his outdated phone. Those three months in Australia were awesome, and I got my mind off things for a little. I was ready to start fresh when I got back from the trip, until my uncle told me that someone had texted me on my old phone, but because he didn't know English, he didn't know if it was for me or not. I immediately checked it, and there was a message from Richard that said, Jenny, I'm so sorry for my last message. I miss you so much. Your smile, your eyes, your voice. I hope you can give me another chance. Love, Richard. OMG! Months had passed since he'd sent it, and the worst part of all is that my uncle had read the message, and so it said seen. This was a disaster. Okay, but I had to focus on the positive. He missed me. Maybe it wasn't too late. I tried to call him, but he didn't answer, so I texted him and explained what had happened. He finally replied and said he thought I'd given up on him. I'd never give up on him. We then had a proper phone call. I am still thinking about you all the time. Why didn't you send me a Facebook message? The words tumbled out of my mouth in a rush, as if I was afraid I would lose contact with him again in any sec. Suddenly, he went all quiet, and then he told me he'd recently met someone, and that he hoped I'd understand and still want to be friends. I felt devastated. Why was it so hard for us? But in the end, there was no other choice for me. 
I had just wished him well and hung up. All I could do now was move on. It was time to find someone else to date. Clearly Richard and I weren't meant to be. My heart hurt, but I found a job and threw myself into it, giving it all my attention. Eventually I got promoted and after five years I was able to help my parents pay off their debt. I even moved up to a management position. Of course, during this time I dated a bit, but I couldn't make any of the relationships last. I just missed Richard all the time. I kept dreaming of us spending Christmas together. It was so frustrating. I mean, it had been five years, and we hadn't spoken at all. Why couldn't I just get over him? I occasionally went on his Facebook page, but all I could see was his profile pic that remained the same for years. I'd unfriended Anastasia and Pavel, too, so I couldn't stalk them either. For all I knew, he could be someone's husband now. Maybe even a dad. And yet still, I never gave up hope that maybe we'd meet in real life, our paths would cross, and we'd finally get to be together. I couldn't stop thinking about this. And then three weeks before Christmas, I got a new following request on Instagram. I couldn't believe it. It was Pavel. And he was now married to Anastasia. This made me so happy. And he told me they were going on their honeymoon to Korea and hoped to see me. OMG, this was so exciting. I desperately wanted to ask him about Richard, but I was terrified to hear that he had kids or something. Anastasia messaged me too and asked how I was doing. I told her I was still single because I worked all the time. Hey, there was no way I could tell her it was because I was still obsessed with Richard. Anyway, the week flew by and finally I was at the airport awaiting to meet Pavel and Anastasia in real life. They both looked so sweet and I gave them the biggest hugs. After hugging them, I noted someone standing behind them. Oh, and gee... Was that Richard? What was he doing there? I was so stunned I couldn't move. It it was really him. Pavel broke the silence by saying, We brought Richard along for you, Jenny. Feel free to hit him, bite him, kick him, or whatever you want to do if, if you think he deserves it. Out of complete shock, I just burst into tears. It had been six long years of total silence, and now here he was, looking at me. I asked myself, could I hug him? but I didn't even get a chance to answer my thought because he ran towards me and picked me up in his arms, squeezing me tightly. Then he whispered in my ear, I'm so sorry, Jenny. Please don't cry. I'm here. I won't leave you. I promise. Could I trust him, though? I was still in shock as I drove them to their hotel, and then again later when I drove to take them out for some Korean food. I was nervous about hanging out with them all, but we seriously had the best night eating, drinking, and laughing. The next day, Pavel and Anastasia would start their honeymoon. So maybe then Richard and I would have some time alone together to talk about whatever was left between us. After dropping them back at their hotel, I was driving away when suddenly I saw Richard running back towards me. He said he wanted to tell me something, so I pulled over and we sat down on a bench to talk. I listened as he told me that over the past six years he tried to date other girls, but it never worked out because I was always in the back of his mind. He said he'd spend most of his time working so he could save up to visit me or buy me a ticket so I could come and visit him. It had taken him longer than he'd hoped because his parents had got divorced and he'd been looking after his mom who was super depressed. A few months later, she was diagnosed with cancer and so he'd had to work even harder to help her pay for treatment. After three long years of fighting, she sadly passed away. And ever since then, he'd been feeling so lonely and sad. One day he asked Pavel to contact me somehow And when he found out I was still single, he was over the moon and decided it was finally time to come to Korea and see me. He said seeing me in real life had made him fall even more in love with me, which he hadn't thought was even possible. Then he hugged me tight and I couldn't stop crying. We spent Christmas together, just like I always dreamt of. And well, the rest is history. Here I am now, packing my bags to fly to the Czech Republic to see Richard. I can't wait to meet his family. And you'll never believe it but we're even planning our wedding. The big question is, where do we live? Should I go there or should he move to Korea? To be honest, it doesn't matter. As long as we're together, it'll be perfect. So it's true what they say. If something is meant to be, it'll be. Even if it takes a year or six, all I know is that I'm glad I had the patience because I've never been happier. Hi guys, my name's Rachel and I want to tell you my big secret. Most people hate pain, right? When they stub their toe or nick their finger, they say ouch and shake the area they hurt like a maniac. I've seen other people do this. My mom, for instance, as she's the clumsiest person ever. But I'm not like most other people. You see, 
I'm a masochist. This means I get pain for pleasure. Yeah. So, okay, I know it sounds wrong, but to me, it just feels so right. It all started when I was 10. I was a naughty kid. I drew on walls, threw rocks at my neighbor's window, and swore a lot. One time, I was in my parents' room searching through their things when I saw my mom's favorite silver necklace. It was so pretty. So, like a magpie drawn to shiny things, I couldn't resist picking it up and trying it on. Mom came in and yelped when she saw me wearing it. What do you think you're doing, young lady? Take that off this instant. No, it's mine. I clutched onto it. Mom got mad and screamed out how I was a vile child. This made me angry, so I yanked the necklace off, which broke the chain. Then I threw it at her as I said, Here, have it. Mom saw red and slapped me hard across my face. I felt a jolt of pain, so I ran to my room. It hurt, but it kind of felt exciting. I was too young to understand it. All I knew back then was that I found it thrilling. Mom came into my room and apologized to me. I'm very sorry for slapping you. Can you ever forgive me? I quickly smiled and said, Sure, it's quite all right. This surprised her, as I normally held a grudge. I decided to get in trouble again so I could see if my pain thrill was a one-off or not. I went into the kitchen, grabbed a plate, and smashed it. My parents were furious at me, especially when I shrugged and told them I'd done it because I just felt like it. My dad grabbed his belt and whipped my hand. Instead of doing the normal kid thing and crying, I smiled. My dad looked at me very oddly. Then he asked me what was wrong. Nothing. I guess I just like the feeling of pain, I replied, like it was no big deal. They were so shocked that my mom almost fainted. She looked at me like a monster and took a step back while tears were falling out of her shocked eyes. She so overreacted. My dad was convinced that I was definitely ill, and they instantly rushed me to the hospital and demanded to see a doctor right away. It wasn't long before the doctor found out what was up with me. No, I wasn't ill. Instead, I was just a masochist. After that, my parents never struck me again. Instead, if I misbehaved, they'd take my phone or games console off me. They told me not to tell anyone that I liked pain, as other people wouldn't understand. I wasn't stupid. I'd already figured out that other people just didn't get it. There have been some occasions where I almost revealed my fondness for pain secret. One time, I accidentally closed my locker while my hand was still there. I was squealing happily and jumping around. One of my friends came to me and said, Are you okay? I told them I was fine. I was just working through the pain. Then, one time in the school canteen, I had a run-in with this girl named Brittany who thought she was amazing because she was a cheerleader, when she was just a mean girl who sucked at the cheer routines. She came up to me and started calling me bad names. I didn't care, as I get so excited when people roast me. But I pretended to get mad, and I threw chocolate pudding at her cheerleader outfit. She flipped out and lunged at me. She actually put her hands around my throat. Do it harder, I coughed out to her. She stopped and told me I was crazy. Then she stormed off. The other kids were looking on in confusion. Then my one friend asked me if I was okay. I rubbed my eyes to make them look red, and I acted like I was upset. Things changed when I met Stanley. He works in my local coffee shop. One day, I was about to order my usual, but he'd already made it up for me. As well as my drink, he also passed me a napkin with his number on it. We started talking, and a few weeks after that, we became official boyfriend and girlfriend. I was so excited, as well as being worried. Stanley didn't know about my love of pain, and I didn't know how to tell him as I didn't want to freak him out. One time I was around him and I accidentally knocked over my glass of wine and cut my hand. I didn't flinch or wince or anything. Instead, I just smiled. My behavior confused Stanley. As he cleaned up my hand, I knew I had to tell him my secret. Um, Stanley... You should probably know that I'm a masochist, which means I get a kick out of feeling pain. His jaw was wide open. I knew I shouldn't have said that. Now he's going to think I'm a weirdo. But surprisingly, he eventually said, Well, it's okay. You're just being yourself. That's what makes you special. 
and then he leaned over and kissed me. Wow. I knew he was amazing, but I didn't realize just how amazing. I was falling for the most perfect and understanding guy ever. A few weeks later, I was over at his place watching a romantic movie when I heard a knock at the door. Stanley quickly opened it, expecting to see the pizza delivery guy. But no. Instead, it was Brittany, the girl who picked a fight with me. Why did she come to Stanley's house? What is she doing at your house? She'd shouted. This was confusing, so I asked Stanley what was going on. Turns out, Brittany is his ex-girlfriend. This was shocking. How could he have dated that bimbo? Brittany started yelling at us. She said some pretty horrible things, but I just smiled at her. Then she picked up a photo frame and hurled it at me. It hit me in the face. It ached, but I just laughed, which made her even angrier. I'm gonna kill you, you freak. She lunged toward me. Stanley grabbed her around the waist and pulled her out of the house. Then he locked the door and called the police to report her. He asked me if I was okay. I was fine. In fact, it'd been an enjoyable experience, and I was giddy and giggly from it. Brittany got into serious trouble. She now stays out of my way, and she knows if she messes with me, she'll end up with a restraining order and have to move schools. Unsurprisingly, I haven't had more trouble off her since, apart from the odd dirty look, but whatever. Thanks for listening to my story. I might like pain and I know it's weird, but no matter with it, right? What do you think of my story? Do you feel pain just like me? Please leave a comment as I'd love to read them. Hi, I'm Stella and I had a boyfriend called Cole. Emphasis on the had. You see, I really liked Cole, but he expected me to do everything for him, but he didn't show me the same respect. I always put him first. One time, I bailed on my friends to see him. Then he canceled on me last minute to watch a baseball match with his brother. But I was mad, so I ended up venting out my problems to one of my guy friends. Then I kissed him. I instantly regretted it. Cole found out, and he broke up with me. Then, the next day, he started dating this annoying sophomore girl. Like, seriously, couldn't he stick to a girl his own age, as he was a senior? How dare Cole break up with me? Yes, I made a mistake, but only because he let me down. I'd made one lame mistake, but other than that, I tried my hardest to be an awesome girlfriend to him. He was clearly waiting for me to mess up so he could break up with me for her. The anger toward Cole was eating me up. Revenging him was all I could think about. One day at lunch, my best friend Sophia's boyfriend Branson told me about this spiritualist his mom saw. Apparently, she cast a spell to help her get over her boyfriend leaving her. I wasn't really into the spiritual stuff and such, but I guessed it was worth a try. So after school, Branson took me to see her. She lived up in this creepy alley. It was eerily quiet. Yet, it felt like I was being watched. I gave him this you-must-be-kidding look, but he grabbed my arm and pulled me forward. A middle-aged woman answered the door. Her dark hair was so long, it almost reached her hips, and she was wearing this flowy dress. I'm still... I started. Yes, I know. She waved me forward. Come in, come in. Branson waited outside, and I gave him a this-is-weird look before I followed this woman inside. She led me into a small room full of crystals, glass balls, and jars full of different things such as spices, colored ribbons, and flowers. So, you, um, make spells? I asked her. Yes, I do, she smiled at me. But beware. Magic is a powerful thing that doesn't always work the way intended. Um, I want a spell to make my ex Cole break up with his girlfriend and want me back. She asked for my hair. I mean, just a single hair, not all of it. I pulled out three strands of my hair and gave it to her feeling so confused. Then she asked for Cole's stuff. I shook my head tentatively. Then I remembered that I had one of his earphones in my backpack. This must be really serious. She asked me again if I was sure, and I gave a nod of my head. Like, seriously, didn't this woman want to make money? 
Then she used my hair to wrap around and around Cole's earphone, then closed her eyes and began chanting words that I couldn't quite make out. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. What was going on? I was so relieved to leave her house, and I told Branson to never ever give me any of his bright ideas again. Now I was down $100 and had been totally freaked out. Over the next few days, I didn't give the spell much thought. I got over Cole and what he did to me. Things were good, but then something crazy happened. At 9 p.m. on a rainy Friday night, there was a knock at my door. My parents were out, so I answered it. Cole was standing on my doorstep, a soggy mess. He actually got down on his knees and begged me to take him back. It was crazy. I told him to go away and slammed the door shut on him. He continued to knock and shouted that he loved me and wanted me back. He'd ended things with his girlfriend as she didn't own his heart. I did. Okay, it was weird. This guy may have looked like Cole, but he certainly wasn't acting like him. He eventually left, but the next morning, he was back again, sobbing out how he couldn't live without me in his life. He didn't seem normal. He was out of his mind. It got so bad that my dad threatened to call the police unless he left right away. Eventually, he did leave, but on Monday morning, he was waiting for me by my locker with a cuddly bear and a box of chocolates. The other kids were laughing as they walked past, and I found myself laughing too. Go away, Cole. I don't like you, and I never will. You're a loser, I told him. He looked like he was going to cry. I have to admit that seeing him this distressed felt good. But a week later, his weird behavior continued. He was still following me around and buying me gifts. This had gone too far, and I needed to do something about it. So I opened up to Branson about it. He told me not to worry and said he'd visit the spiritualist and get her to undo the spell. I guess it worked, as Cole finally seemed to get the message and his behavior mellowed down. But then something weird began to happen to me. I had a dream about getting with Branson, and now I can't stop thinking about him. On a few occasions, I've walked over to his house at night in a trance-like state. It's taken all my will not to knock on his door. Seeing Sophia all loved up with him makes me want to puke. I never had feelings for Branson before. What if he cast a spell on me to make me fall for him? I went back to the old alley to find the spiritualist woman, but I couldn't find the house. It's like the house and the spiritualist woman have never existed. Okay, so something else weird happened too. I was in the park one day, and I was sure I saw Branson talking to Cole. They looked really chatty. They weren't friends, so what was going on? I can't go straight to my best friend's boyfriend to ask shameful questions like, did you put a love spell on me? Or did you set up this whole thing with Cole to make me fall for you? I don't know what's going on. All I know is, as ridiculous as this may sound, I have this desire to be around Branson all the time. I've had crushes on boys before, but never like this. I don't know what's happening or what I should do next. In high school, there are always those mean girls, right? Well, turns out, I was actually the mean girl, and it took something really awful for me to realize it. You see, I'm a pretty average kind of girl. Average looking, average grades, and I guess you could say I'm a little chubby. Yeah, I'm that invisible. But thank God, I had some good friends, so it's okay. I'm content with my mediocre life, but one day, I received a note in my locker. There's even a heart on it. My heart started beating so fast. Could it be? I read on and couldn't believe it. It was from a guy called Dave, and he was confessing his feelings for me. He even left his phone number. I was stunned. And then I got to the bottom of the note, and reality hit me smack bang in the face. I'll be waiting for your call, Sarah. It wasn't for me. It was for Sarah. Of course it was for Sarah. All the boys fancied her. 
And who wouldn't? She was the prettiest girl in school. Plus, her locker was right next to mine, so he just made a mistake. I was about to pop it in her locker when I saw her walking towards me. I tried to hide my disappointment that the note hadn't been for me. It drove me crazy to see her bouncing towards me with her blonde, curly hair and gorgeous smile. When she saw me, she started making small talk and even complimented me on my cardigan. It was so weird. What's so good about that to talk about? Was that compliment a kind of sarcasm or something? This angelic girl always gave me uneasy feelings. I bet she's that type of mean girl that's just being nice to your face, then later comes home and puts your name in her burn book. After she walked away, I scrunched up the note and threw it in my bag. Later that night, I did something insane. I texted Dave, pretending to be Sarah. I don't know why I did it, but after a few texts back and forth, it actually became quite fun. I looked him up on social media, and I couldn't believe how handsome he was. He was a year older, and so his classes were in another building. No wonder I hadn't noticed him before. Even our cafeterias were in different buildings, so he'd probably never seen me either. Not that he would notice me anyway, though. I felt so wild messaging him. I'd never done anything like this before, and it actually felt quite fun to pretend to be Sarah. I could just talk to him so freely and didn't have to overthink if I was sounding like a loser. Because in those moments, I was Sarah, the most popular girl in school. And it felt amazing. It didn't matter what I said, because I knew that David thought I was Sarah. And so everything I said to him was funny or cute. I even told my best friend Clara what I was doing, and she was amazed that I had the courage to do such a thing. I showed her our texts, and she was like, Wow, girl. You are crazy. I continued to text him, though, and eventually, I found I couldn't stop. I didn't know how long I could keep it up before I got caught, but I figured I'd get bored before then anyway. But then one day, he asked me to meet him after school, and I froze. Obviously, I couldn't meet him, nor let him approach the real Sarah in real life. So I made up some excuse about how my parents were super strict, and I'd get in trouble if anyone saw us. But he insisted, saying he had a gift for me, so I told him to leave it on top of the vending machine for me instead. To my surprise, he thought this was a really romantic idea, and so he agreed. Throughout the next week, he left me a gift every day. One day, it was a small crystal in the shape of a rose. The next day, it was a book of poetry. That was sweet. I didn't expect such delicacy from a jock. And then he asked me to meet him at the basketball game that Friday. He sounded so serious. I guess his patience had run out. Well, of course, it would be too absurd to go to the same school, but didn't see each other at all for two weeks straight, right? I had no other choice but to agree. But then, the panic kicked in. It was the finale of a big tournament at school, so everyone was going. And Sarah will be there too. And if Dave saw her, no, it would just be... A disaster! My life would be over if they knew what I'd been up to. I asked Clara what I should do, and she was like, What? You haven't ended that catfishing thing yet? You need to tell him now, before it's too late. She'd called me a catfish! I was so offended, so I just stormed off and said I'd make my own plan without her help. I knew exactly what I was going to do. When I got home, I raided my mom's medicine cabinet and found it. Her laxative syrup. I poured a little into a fruity drink I'd bought. Obviously, I'd followed the instructions and only poured a little. I mean, I didn't want to knock Sarah out. I just wanted to give her enough so she'd miss the game. Little did I know how badly this was all going to unfold. When I got to school the next day, I made sure I was early and put it on Sarah's desk. I heard footsteps, though, and almost jumped out of my skin. Luckily, it was just Clara. And when she asked me what I was up to, I just said I'd seen a boy dropping this off on Sarah's desk and had felt jealous, so I'd taken a look. Sarah later took it without hesitation, since receiving gifts from secret admirers wasn't new to her. Well, success. After P.E. later that day, Sarah drank it. But then, disaster struck. Her friends also wanted a sip, so she passed it around. And to my complete horror... Clara had a sip too. I wanted to jump in and stop them, but I couldn't. In the next class, everyone kept running to the bathroom. It was so awkward. Luckily, Clara only had one bathroom trip, 
and then she was fine. She thought she'd just eaten something bad. If only she knew the truth. Sarah must have drunk much more than the others, because she still looked pale after several trips. During break, I went over to her and asked if she was okay. Then I suggested she go home and rest, and even offered to help her walk to her car. At that point, I was actually more worried for her than for my plan, but, well, my plan did work anyway. Later that night, Dave texted me saying he couldn't find me at the basketball game. Well, me, meaning Sarah. I told him I wasn't feeling well, and so he said he'd send me a gift the next day to make me feel better. Well, that was the moment Clara came over and confronted me. She busted into my room saying, I know what you did. Isn't that too much? Then she said she'd seen the syrup in my backpack. I was stunned. But then I just told her that it was time those mean girls got a taste of their own medicine. But she was furious. She said, you're ridiculous. Sarah isn't a mean girl. She's so sweet. She's even nice to you. Are you that blinded by jealousy that you'd sink this low to hurt her? You know what? You're the only mean girl around here. At that, she stormed off, leaving me standing there all alone. I froze there, dumbfounded. What just happened? What did I just hear? Was I the mean girl? That couldn't be true, right? Was Clara even my friend? How could she say that to me? She kept calling me catfish, then mean girl. This girl was really too much. But her words kept lingering in my mind. I thought about it. Sarah really had never done me any harm. So why was I being so mean to her? It wasn't right of me. That night, I couldn't sleep. I felt so guilty. I'd really let things get out of control. Why was I even doing this? It's not like I even really liked Dave. Sure, it felt nice to have a cute guy talking to me, but he was only talking to me because he thought I was Sarah. I didn't know what I was trying to do anymore. The day after, Dave had left a new gift box on the vending machine. I kept looking at it and wasn't sure if I should take it. But then suddenly, a guy noticed it, took it down, and saw it was addressed to Sarah. Then he quickly ran to class and gave it to her. It all happened so quickly, I didn't even have time to react. I ran after him to see what would happen next. Sarah and her friends were all gathered around the box and kept saying, Dave? Isn't he your crush? That Dave Miller? Wow, girl, congrats! But why did he leave a gift for you? I could see Sarah was blushing, and that's when I realized she actually liked him. Oh my god, I'd messed everything up! She was so happy, which made me feel even worse. Clara was right. I was the mean girl, not Sarah. I had to act quick before Sarah found Dave and they both discovered the truth. I texted Dave and asked him to meet me at the park in secret. As soon as I arrived, I could see he was there already, excitedly waiting. I hid behind a tree from afar and called him, and then I asked him to let me explain first. I told him I wasn't Sarah, and then I'd been doing this because I was just tired of feeling like a loser. But I didn't expect I'd taken this all too far. I'm so sorry, I said to him. He was so confused and kind of angry at first. But then, after a while, he said that back in middle school, he'd been a bit of a nobody, so he could understand where I was coming from, but he needed time to process it all. When he was about to hang up, I said, wait, then ran towards him and said I was the girl on the phone and that I had good news for him, that the real Sarah actually did like him too, and that all he needed to do was go and get her. He looked unsure and said, you're not lying to me again, are you? Then I said, I swear. She's got the biggest crush on you. Please let me make up for this all. I'll help you. He looked so happy, and I felt better knowing I was helping this happy couple get together. They deserved each other. I even helped him choose out the next gift for Sarah. Yep, the actual Sarah this time. And ever since then, I kind of became his wingman. As for Clara, of course, I apologized to her and thanked her for being a good friend and for knocking some sense into me. And now, Sarah and Dave are officially a couple, and I even hang out with them sometimes. In fact, Dave's friend has been hitting on me, so let's see if anything happens there. Maybe I'll finally get a real boyfriend.
on my very first day of high school, I showed up in my extreme goth girl attire as every other day. I felt good, but unfortunately, the teacher didn't appreciate my look as she gave me this disgusted stare and blurted out, How peculiar. Excuse me? So how do you define normal? How come being your true self is abnormal, but it's totally fine to live a fake, boring life just to fit into this judgmental society? The whole class gasped and stared at me. As for the teacher, I'd rendered her speechless. I guess word got around, as at recess this red-haired goth boy smiled at me and said, Hey, it's Miranda, right? Do you want to join my group? Well, no need to ask twice. This guy was cute. And everyone in this group was goth, too. This was where I belonged. They share my views on how the media's unattainable standards of beauty are fake and how pathetic everyone is for striving to look like mass-produced dolls. Ugh. I like them. Actually, I didn't have many friends. You see, as soon as I discovered my true identity at 13 and started dressing this way, my old friends ditched me. People are always so quick to judge and don't gel well with others that are different. It's so lame. But whatever. Those bland blenders could never understand my effort to stand out and be true to myself. The only girl who stuck around was Isabel. She's been my best friend since we were six. And my black lipstick and chokers didn't scare her off. My parents just thought I was going through a rebellious phase. So they let me do what I wanted. Only my older sister Harper was bitter about it. Oh, please! Biologically and technically, you are not a goth. You're an American who likes the gothic style. Huh. <laughs> Jealous much? You see, Harper was your standard girl-next-door type. Just like everybody else. Yawn. Whatever. As it's her business. I don't care. But please don't force me to be like her. Ugh! Okay, back to school things. From that day onward, I joined the goths. They were all very cool. Especially the red-haired guy, Ralph. The more time I spent with him, the more I knew we were made for each other. So one time, I confided in Isabel about my feelings for him and told her I was planning to ask him to be my boyfriend. Are you sure? It's just you haven't known him long and you don't know how he feels about you. Oh, bless. Isabel was being her usual sweet, caring, worried self. But come on, this was a sure bet. It's okay, Izzy. I'm the coolest one, not only in my group, but also in this school. There's no way he can turn me down. No. Ralph's answer cut right through me without any hesitation. I haven't even finished my love confession. Ouch. Seeing me dead still and mouth wide open, Ralph continued, Look, Miranda, your style is so cool, and I know you're one of us, but honestly, whenever I talk to you, I think it's just so tasteless. Besides, I'm already dating Aaron, so we should just be friends. Tasteless? What did he mean, tasteless? And OMG, Aaron? Unbelievable. Her goth makeup and outfits were no way near as good as mine. What did she have that I didn't? Furious, I stomped home, rushed to my room, and screamed into my pillow. On hearing this, Harper hurried in and asked me what was up. I needed to talk to someone, so I blurted it all out to her. Wow. She raised her eyebrows. Rude. Still. She paused, scratching her chin. Uh-oh. I know she always does that thing whenever she's about to say something mean. You know, that Ralph guy does have a point. I mean, instead of spending three hours a day applying endless layers of makeup, you could use that time to learn how to be less boring. She shrugged. What? Shut up! Get out of my room! I furiously pushed her out and slammed the door. But, come to think of it, what if the other kids stopped being friends with me? And not because of my look, but due to my tastelessness. Nah, that can't be the case. Harper was just being her usual ridiculous self. So I stayed loyal to myself throughout high school and continued to live life my way. No one can make me change my mind, ever. Yeah, I know senior year is important, which is why I made a conscious effort to attend the college enrollment fair. After a while of wandering around, I found myself drawn to the social science section of one university. This was it. This is what I wanted to major in. This was so exciting. I'd finally found something else amazing besides the goth lifestyle. That night I asked Harper to take a photo of me to send with my application file. She gave me this dirty look and replied, 
You really think they'd want to interview a student looking like they belong in Dracula's castle? No, she did not just say that. How disrespectful. Why do people care so much about appearances? You pick someone due to their caliber, not the surface. Well, if looks are not so important, why don't you just quit being angry, get changed, and just take a simple photo? Harper raised her voice. Ugh, arguing with her was pointless. So I ran back to my room and locked myself in there for two whole days. Ugh, I hated this world. I had a lot of thinking time, which made me realize I do really want to major in social science. So I decided to listen to Harper, remove my makeup, fix my hair, and borrow her clothes for the picture. Oh my god! No, I can't even look in the mirror. I looked horrible. But Harper thought otherwise. I told her to just take the dumb photo. But she ran off and dragged along my parents, who cooed and clapped on seeing my new look. You look so beautiful, honey! My mom held her chest. Were those tears in her eyes? Oh, man, this was so lame. This wasn't me. I'm not some insignificant, boring-looking girl. Ugh! As soon as Harper took the photo, I darted toward the door, desperate to return to my goth look. Please, Miranda. My parents both grabbed my arms. You look so much better this way. But this isn't me. If I don't stay goth, then I'll be losing myself. I shook them off. A few weeks later, I got a reply from the university. I had got through to the online interview stage. Whoa. But this time, I wouldn't change myself. During the interview, one professor asked me about my social experiences, such as part-time jobs or social volunteer services. Um, I hadn't done any. I'd thought of that once in a while, but due to my goth look, I didn't get to work anywhere. I admitted that to the professor and proudly announced, being goth is my true identity. A few weeks later, I received their response email. Harper, Isabel, and my parents gathered around me in the living room, but, oh no, I muttered out once I opened the email. They rejected me. I stood up and tearfully ran back to my room, while Isabel followed me. Don't worry. Isabel sat down next to me and rubbed my arm. They have another enrollment in the autumn. So you still have a few more months to prepare. I don't need it anymore. Just leave me alone. I must have freaked her out as she quietly left after that. The next day, I was so bummed out, so I went to see my goth friends. Surely my own kind would make me feel better, right? People are ridiculous, but no one can stop us from being ourselves, Ralph heroically said. Well, I didn't feel any better, but at least there was someone on the same page with me. Still in a frustrated mood, I later on skipped dinner and went straight to my room. Harper then entered my room and talked to me in a serious tone. Stop sulking. I've seen that email and your profile. Here's the ugly truth. They didn't reject you because you're a goth. They rejected you because... You're just a bland person with below average grades and no social experience whatsoever. I threw my pillow at her, demanded she leave my room right now and never come back. But that night I couldn't sleep. Her words were bugging me. I don't know, maybe she was kind of right. I mean, I guess I could do more to help my case, as I knew I really, really wanted to study that major at that university. So the next day I started looking for a part-time job. But everywhere required this gross uniform and decent look. Jeez, come on, I just can't. I felt so terrible being something that I'm not. I was about to give up when Isabel came to me and said, Be strong. Think about your dream college and your future. She patted my back. This is just temporary, okay? What a sweet friend she is. All right, gotta get back on my feet. I patiently kept looking, and finally, a cafe accepted me as a waitress. Of course, no goth look, though. Ugh. One evening after work, I was about to go home when I ran into the goth group. Hey, guys! I cheerfully greeted them. What's the event tonight? Noticing their confused look, I said, It's me, Miranda. They burst out laughing. Seriously? Miranda, is it really you? Then some of them pulled out their phones and started taking pictures. My Instagram is gonna love this. While the others kept ridiculing me, this was heartbroken. I thought they were my people. Why didn't they give me even a second to explain? Now it turns out they were the most judgmental people ever. 
What a toxic group of friends. I wasn't going to waste my time hanging out with them anymore. Lesson learned. Over the next few months, I focused on working at the cafe, and I joined a group of active young people, handing out food for homeless people and helping nurses at old people homes. I'd experienced so many new things, and to be honest, I got used to this mediocre look. Actually, there's this one guy in my volunteer group. He's called Roger, and I may have a slight crush on him. At first, I didn't even notice him, because he looks normal. Basic haircut, t-shirts, jeans, and sneakers. Until one time, in the nursing home, I was struggling with this very bitter and difficult old lady who was accusing me of stealing her slippers. Then Roger, with his gentle nature and soothing voice, slid in and diffused the situation. On top of that, he was an amazing storyteller, as he always mesmerized everyone around, including me. Ah. <sighs> okay, so looking normal didn't mean someone was boring. Yeah, I know the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. Well, it turns out that saying is 100% true. In early October, Harper helped me apply again. And guess what? I successfully passed the online interview and received an offer email. My family was in seventh heaven. My parents couldn't stop the happy tears. While Harper just proudly smiled at me, and Isabel hugged me tightly. We even went on vacation to celebrate. It was terrific. Now, I still love my gothic look. But at the same time, I love my natural look, too. I've realized that identifying yourself by how you look on the surface is nonsense, and so is judging people by the way they look. Having an interesting life and being beautiful is not just about obsessively focusing on how you appear. It comes from within. Wait, is that Roger over there? Oh no, he's coming this way. He's waving at me. Perhaps this is my chance. Hey, I'm Callie. I'm almost 16, but I could live in peace only in the first two years of my child's life, until my little brother, Ethan, came along and ruined everything. I always hoped that that little brat had never been born, and if you're the oldest sibling like I am, then chances are you'll feel the same way as I do. Firstly, his birth meant that my parents barely noticed me anymore. Yeah, I know I was two back then, so I don't actually remember this, but as the years passed by, I saw how it was. I got into trouble for dumb things because I was the oldest, while Ethan got away with everything because he was too young to understand. Ugh, oh, I really hate my brother. And I could tell tons of reasons for that. We always fought over the last slice of pizza. When he got it, he'd eat it open-mouthed in front of me. And mom would smile and say, Ah, oh, my growing boy. But when I got it, Mom would frown at me and say, Callie, don't be greedy. Ugh! He'd sneak into my room and took the plushy bunny my bestie gave me and super glued its ears together. So I took his switch and hid it in the basement. It took him an entire week to find it. Ha! <laughs> in revenge, he smeared chocolate over the back of my pants. I only realized what was going on when other kids started laughing and pointing at me. I had to wear my sweater tied around my waist for the rest of the day even though it was freezing. So, I retaliated by rubbing stinging nettles on his pillow. The next morning, his face was bright red, and he couldn't stop itching. It was so funny. It was also a photo shoot day. So much to his protests, a makeup artist spent ages applying makeup on him to cover up the redness. He looked so ridiculous. <laughs> you see, my dad's a politician, so sometimes we have to appear in photo shoots where we look like a loving, harmonious family. As if. I could play pretend for the cameras, but in reality, I really just wanted to kick my brother's butt. We just didn't get on at all. He's such a brat. So, I guess pranking each other was our coping strategy. I mean, hey, it isn't easy living with someone you hate. Our pranks happen so often that our parents just let us get on with it. However, there is one thing Ethan is terrified of. It all started back when he was eight, and Dad was watching The Walking Dead. Me and Ethan walked into the room just as there was a zoom-in scene in which a zombie was having a feeding frenzy. Being the brave girl, I thought it was interesting and sat down and watched it with Dad. But my bro, being the wuss, he screamed, then ran out of the room, hid under our parents' bed, burst into tears, and refused to move for two hours because he was convinced that at the sight of that zombie, 
He knew he must be chosen, and zombies were going out to get him. Got Achilles' heel. So, not long after that, when he dropped my brand new headphones down the toilet, which made me have to put my hand in to pick it up, I decided to get revenge on him. And luckily for me, Halloween was just around the corner. Perfect. I binge-watched makeup tutorials on YouTube and practiced on my friends. Then on Halloween, I turned myself into a seriously scary zombie, hid the video camera in his room, got into his closet, and made grumbling and moaning sounds. When he opened the closet door, I jumped out at him and tackled him to the floor. OMG, he screamed so loudly and he actually peed his pants. And now, all these years later, I still have it on video to torment him with. Ha! But don't be fooled, as my brother was not your average kitty. It wasn't that long ago that he played a prank on me, which made me madder than Misty from Pokemon. So, I had a crush on this boy from school. He was just so sweet and dreamy, and from the cute glances he kept on giving me, I was 100% sure he liked me too. Valentine's Day seemed like the perfect day to express my feelings toward him, so I stayed up until midnight the night before making chocolate for him. I left my chocolates lovingly wrapped and boxed on the side in the kitchen and went to bed. The next day, I grabbed the box and at lunchtime, I handed it to my crush. To my utter dismay when he opened it, Instead of the lovely heart-shaped chocolates I'd spent hours making, there were embarrassing childhood pics of me, including a photo from when I was 12 with a bunch of hideous pimples on my face. One of me as a toddler sleeping with my mouth open and saliva drool on my chin, and one of me as a baby with a bowl of food mush on my head. Then my crush lifted up a note saying, Great chocolate, sis. That sneaky brat. Although my crush kept saying that I looked really cute in those photos and he liked them even more than chocolates, I still wanted to give that brat a hard punch right in his annoying face. Oh god, I'm begging you, please take him away from me. I'll be good. I'll do my homework on time and I'll stop borrowing mom's expensive perfume. Okay, so this may have been my wish, but I never expected that it would come true. It was a normal evening around the dinner table. Ethan was glued to his phone and mom got really annoyed and made him clear up the table. While he was doing that, I saw a message pop up on his phone from someone called Sophie, saying, Okay, I'll see you in the front of the cinema at 8pm. I'm looking forward to it, smiley face. What? Ethan had a date? Oh, my sweet little bro. It was payback time for ruining my crush's chocolates. So I stealthily followed Ethan to the cinema. Because the cinema was pretty close to our home, we both walked. He cut through the park. Jeez, it was creepy at this time. I swear the trees looked like monsters. Anyway, I saw something light up by my feet. I picked it up. It was Ethan's phone. What an idiot. I was so going to make him work hard to get this back. As I walked out of the park, I saw a black van parked nearby. Suddenly, I heard a scream and saw two giant men trying to drag Ethan toward the back of the van. Ethan was crying and struggling with fierce resistance, but my weak, skinny 14-year-old brother was no rival for those two men. What? How dare they try and kidnap my brother? He might have been the most annoying human on the planet, but he was my annoying little brother. There's no way I was letting this happen. I rushed forward and shouted, Ethan, zombie mode on! My presence startled the two kidnappers, and this made them more intent on dragging him toward the van. When all of a sudden, Ethan bit down hard into the hand of the man who was covering his mouth, just like how zombies always do. Good one, bro. The man wept out and shook his hand. The other man pulled on Ethan's arm, but he managed to scramble to his feet. As the man tried to push him into the van, Ethan sought his opportunity and kicked him right between his legs. Ouch. While this was going on, I called the cops and told them to be quick. Then I saw the jerk with the bitten hand about to grab Ethan again. So I screamed out loud, Ethan, run! He sprinted off into the park and the bitten man followed him. It was exactly a real-life zombie chase. Huh. Suddenly, I felt arms grab me around the waist. Oh no, it was the other guy. He said, I guess you'll have to go too. Before he lifted me up and carried me over to the back of the van. I screamed out and tried hitting and kicking out, but he was too strong. He threw me into the back of the van before he could get in. I smashed the van door and quickly locked the door from the inside to knock him out. Lucky for me, not him, but the guy chasing Ethan was the one who was keeping the key. It was so scary when the kidnapper kept shouting at me outside. 
But I was even more frightened thinking Ethan could get hurt somewhere out there. Then suddenly I heard his voice. Hey, stop. Did he get caught? I looked out to see the contrary. He was running towards me after two police officials. They were holding their guns to control the guy standing by the van. Ethan was safe and came back for me. I opened the door and jumped into his arms. Oh, let's skip this part. I get goosebumps every time I recall this weepy situation. Me and Ethan followed the cops and saw the other kidnapper handcuffed to a tree, fighting with mosquitoes with his one free arm in the dark. The police told me that during the way heading to the van, Ethan kept on complaining about how slow and unprofessional they were, as they should come to save me first instead. My boy still stubbornly said, I could run myself, but this wimp couldn't. The idiot definitely couldn't have imagined that he has a Wonder Woman big sister like me. <laughs> Our parents rushed into the police department to see us. And yep, weepy part again. Turned out my dad's rival had hired the guy to kidnap Ethan so that they could use him to blackmail my dad. I don't clearly understand the whole situation. Maybe after this I'll watch more political movies. But now, thanks God, we're safe. I may have wished my brother would disappear, but when I actually could have lost him forever, well, I have to admit that it really freaked me out. And it turns out, he felt the same way about me too. Crazy, huh? Of course, we still play pranks on each other. We wouldn't be us if we didn't. But I realized something. He might be the most annoying brat ever, but he's still my family. And I love my family so much. However, I'm pretty sure there'll still be times when I hate my annoying little bro. Like right now. While I'm sitting in my room telling you my story, I'm sure I can hear him giggling outside of my door. What's the betting I open it and end up with a bucket of cold water on my head or something? All this may because I have told my mom he has a girlfriend. Tough luck, little bro. There's no way you're getting the better of this pranking queen.